السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السيدات والسادة صباحكم فرح حياكم الله في اليوم الثالث من أيام منتدى جدة الاقتصادي الصورة النمطية عنا نحن الإعلاميون أننا كثيرا ما نفشي الأسرار وهي صورة سلبية نود أن نغيرها دوما لكني مضطر أن أفشي لكم اليوم سرا لم أنم ليلة البارحة إلا بضع ساعات سهرت معي في غرفتي سيدة جميلة أغواني حسنها وأسهرتني عظمتها إنها سيدة مهتمة بالاستثمار الاستثمار المضمون طويل الأجل كانت السيدة التي حضرت أمس هي والدتي التي توفيت قبل ثلاث سنوات اليوم هو عيد الأم وكما كل الأمهات فقد ركزنا استثمارهن في فلذات أكبادهن رحم الله أمي وأم من مات منكم وحفظ الله الأحياء من الأمهات عذرا لخروجي عن الموضوع وعضوا وعذرا لولوغي فيه ندوتنا هذا اليوم أيها السادة والسيدات بعد أن تحدثنا بالأمس في جلسات متفاوتة عن تأثير القوى العالمية وحاورنا قائدا عالميا هو رئيس وزراء تركيا رجب أردوغان ثم تناولنا مواطنة مزدهرة وتحدثنا عن الطبقة الوسطى كما تحدثنا عن اتجاهات التكنولوجيا العالمية والتحولات العظمى فاليوم معنا أربع جلسات وجلستان جانبيتان أولى هذه الجلسات هي ندوة اليوم التي تتحدث عن الدولة بوصفها شريكا وتدير هذه الندوة الدكتورة ناهد طاهر والدكتورة ناهد محمد طاهر هي المدير التنفيذي لبنك جالفان للاستثمار ورئيس مجلس إدارة شركة البوصلة للاستشارات المالية تعتبر الدكتورة ناهد من خلال موقعها الحالي أول سيدة تؤسس وتتصدر منصب الرئيس التنفيذي لبنك استثماري خليجي وبالإضافة إلى ذلك فهي شريك تدير شركة البوصلة الدولية للمشورة المالية في جدة عملت سابقا في البنك الأهلي التجاري بجدة بمنصب كبير الاقتصاديين ورئيس لجنة إدارة المخاطر والمحافظ أنا واثق أنها ستدير محفظة هذه الندوة ومخاطرها على أفضل ما يكون فأترك الميكروفون لها وأتمنى لكم يوما سعيدا شكرا أستاذ تركي على المقدمة الرائعة أهلا بكم اليوم ويشرفني تواجدي معكم في هذا المنتدى وخاصة في هذا الموضوع يعني بعد الشرف الأكبر قصدي أنه الملك عبد الله قبل يومين أصدر العديد من الأوامر الملكية فيما يختص بالاستثمار للقطاع الحكومي في العديد من القطاعات الحيوية للمملكة وهنا أود أن أشير إلى كيف يتم تمويل هذه القطاعات بالشراكة بين القطاع العام والقطاع الخاص معي في البانل اليوم الأستاذ علي البراك علي البراك got his master's degree in electrical engineering from University of Colorado he joined electricity company in 1982 he was responsible for central region in 2007 and he became the president and chief executive officer of the Saudi electricity company and until now and inshallah for the long time. <laughs> uh, next to him, I have Mr. Khalid Al-Milhim. Uh, Khalid Al-Milhim uh, position is the director general of Saudi Arabian Airlines. Uh, place and date of birth is Al-Ahsa. At March 1957, nationality is Saudi. He's educated as a Bachelor of Science, Electrical Engineering, Bachelor of Science in Engineering Management, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Indiana in 1980. 
Okay, his work experience in 2006 to date, Director General Saudi Arabia and Airlines. Before that, 2001 to 2006, uh, six President uh, of Saudi Telecom Company, STC, uh, ap appointed as a President of STC on uh, uh, 4th of June. 2001, where, uh, where all restructuring requirements were completed and the company shares placed in public offering. We know STC was a very successful uh, privatization story. The STC is now considered as the largest telecommunication company in the Middle East and one of the 10th largest telecommunications companies in the world. Next to him, I have uh, uh, Mr. Just a minute, please. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Richard McConnick, the Executive Vice Chairman of Bank of America, which is an honor and pleasure to have him here with us today. Uh, Mr. Richard is an ambassador of the uh, is ambassador uh, currently. He served with the White House Treasury Department and the IMF. He was the Under Secretary of State under the first President Bush and principal G7 coordinator uh, of the economic summit. Uh, uh, now he is the executive vice chairman uh, of Bank of America. Uh, he interacts with central banks in the globe and do global macro. Last but not least, Mr. Edward Ogden. Edward Ogden, the managing director, sectors group. Edwin Oakton returned a lead sectors group after four years of the UK's ambassador in the UAE and of the UK's highest growth markets. His previous career has uh, concentrated on the Middle East, uh, defense and security, including as the UK's ambassador for uh, counterterrorism in the aftermath of 9-11. And he served as Prime Minister John Major's Private Secretary for Foreign Affairs, Defense, and North Ireland. Please all welcome all the panelists. Okay. A question before I start my presentation. I'll give a brief presentation on why PPP is important in the uh, kingdom and how does this link to the world. Uh, if you like, please, to answer the question. Can public-private partnership truly improve the efficiency and effectiveness of public services delivery? Wow, that's fantastic. I hope we apply that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, my presentation, please. It definitely will. It definitely will. The, the title of my presentation is The State as Equity Partner, The Future of Public-Private partnership. There is a mix between uh, privatization and public-private partnership. Privatization is fully privatization, giving the public sectors to the private sector, which is not right for some certain sectors like water and electricity, exactly. Okay, and some other services, education, whatever, but public-private partnership is meaning the partnership between both sectors for a long-term investment which makes it a win-win situation and the customer as well is happy with the service. Why PPP is important in the kingdom? You see the guys running with the money and leaving the child and this, because they care about the private sector cares only about money and the public sector cares about only the service. So you need a combination of efforts to make the thing better. Why PPP? If you look at the chart you have here in front of you, 
the blue columns are the potential GDP with the current economic structure. Just because of high unemployment and lack of efficiency in utilization of the money of the oil, we have a GDP that is half what should be in reality. Okay? The red one is the real GDP, the actual. The blue one is the potential. Without any restructuring, without any PPPs, without anything, just if we reduce unemployment and utilize money better. So, that means there is a huge potential to go forward. The huge output gap is reflected by high employment. And as you can see here, Saudi Arabia has the highest rate of unemployment of youth and the total unemployment in the whole Middle East region and among also the even worse than Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Okay, so we all guys has to improve that and this is the only way to go forward. We talk, we've been talking about the public sector and recently uh, the king announced a lot of positions in the public sector, okay, but the private sector is the one that needs to grow in partnership with the public sector. If you see here, Abdel, if you look at the chart, you find the productivity level of the private sector has been growing with a trend going up. Uh, uh, the uh, productivity means the income created by each employee. Okay, relatively, the, the public se uh, uh, sector uh, productivity has been even. Okay, so PPP will need the private sector and this where you will increase the productivity level of the whole GDP. In the whole globe, there is a need for uh, infrastructure and PPP projects. Out of that, if you look down at the GCC, there is an estimation of the awarded project of $1.5 trillion needed to be invested in the awarded only project, not, uh, not in addition to the unannounced project in, in the region, in infrastructure. But where are we from this investment? So if we look at the 1,500 1, uh, billion, which 1.5 trillion dollars, total infrastructure required in the GCC by 2020, okay, the required equity, if you took 70% as a standard of equity to debt, you require $450 billion as equity needed to be invested in such sectors. Out of that, only, there are funds announced and none announced, listed and unlisted, only of $22 billion. So that's only 5% of equity needed to be invested in these sectors. And unfortunately, our region and our uh, investors are hugely into real estate, not considering these uh, sectors as profitable, while it's the most profitable sectors, but it needs a lot of passion and, uh, and patience to see this growing and happening, and that's the only way to create jobs. So if you look at the Saudi Arabia out of the GCC, if you look at Saudi Arabia, you can find the huge financial gap happening here. If you look at the current expenditure, how it's going up, and the spending capex gap, uh, the spending gap of 410 billion is in Saudi Arabia uh, down there. So the expenditure of the government has been going up massively, but the capex is going down as a trend. That's an indicator of how important is PPP to our region. And definitely, if we structure it right, and there are a, a, a great regulation, and even international investors will be more than happy to join and, fi and finance these. Don't tell me financial crisis. It's the potential of the region. The financial crisis now let a lot of international investors, and I have here some panelists with me to say yes or no for that, that will be more than interested to invest in our region, just if we do it legally right. In what sectors are these uh, investments? They are mainly in water, transport, 
Uh, transport, air transport, and public transport, Khalid. So be happy. You need a lot of investors to come to you. <laughs> Electricity, of course, Mr. Ali Barak, is around 121 billion needed out of 885 billion requirement of equity in Saudi Arabia. So it's mainly transport, water, telecom, electricity, and petrochemicals. But unfortunately, we're doing these investors, and yet recently uh, the kingdom has been awarding projects in water and electricity massively, especially in these sectors, but they have been totally highly emitters of carbon emission. If you look at the electricity generation, it's the highest polluter, so I have the earth polluter and the air polluter beside me. <laughs> but we definitely... We definitely need to help them to make this with the right private investment because they are very much restricted with the government budget and the technology they have to use with the cheap oil to burn fuel to make this happen. And this is not the right new ticket direction. I'm sure with our support as financial institutions, as government structuring, we need to support these people to make it more efficient and less pollution. How is this affecting the GDP? Is it uh, emission only affecting the health? No, it's affecting the GDP. It's our GDP is 20% less because of the pollution happening out of the PPP projects or the public sector projects happening in the region, in Saudi Arabia in specific. So that means it makes us more money. Less emission makes money. <laughs> okay, Pete. What are the advantages of PPP? PPP is one of the innovative solutions for addressing infrastructure deficiency. PPP can free up government resources which can be deployed to other competing ends and thereby meeting the challenges of growing demand for infrastructure services. I'll just give here an example through my experience as the only, and I'm proud to say that, the only specialized PPP bank in the whole Middle East. I'm, I'm heading that bank and I saw all the challenges. The, the, the financial structuring and the lack of a unit of PPP within the umbrella of the Ministry of Finance is really lack, uh, and uh, this, uh, this unit of PPP should not be only government, should be um, a 50-50 partnership with private sector, okay, under the umbrella of Ministry of, of Finance to make a strategy for PPP. In the last three years, there have been awarded water project you heard about with billions of dollars. One of them is Ras Azur. With the financial crisis, it came back all to government, which means we are back out of PPP towards government spending. Why? Because of the lack of the right structuring, which made debt difficult to be awarded to such projects. And unfortunately, even the equity given to such projects was given as a bridge finance. So it's all about debt and debt, and the whole world collapsed in debt, so there's no real structuring. Although, the demand for, more, for water in the kingdom is so great, and there is no relation with the oil price going down and up, it will continue to be a sustainable growing demand. Okay? That's one of the examples. Also, the, the pity example is the land bridge project, which the, the king has recently decided to uh, stop it, which is a core, a core project which uh, links the east to the west as a, a, a railway for cargo or freight. This was stopped because of the lack of proper finance and, and lack of real PPP, project, which could reduce the whole cost of shipping for the whole world to take, uh, to, to take uh, goods and services from the West coming to the East, crossing the, the, the Arabian Peninsula rather than going around the Arab Sea. So a lot of projects came back to the government, and now the government is burdened with a lot of projects on their shoulders, and they don't know what to do because they have a lot of things to do. So we should really make private sector and public sector should really collaborate to make PPP happening to help power, air transportation, water, petrochemicals, all these to make creation of jobs, make sustainable income, and I promise you our GDP could grow by 20% in real terms if that happened. PPP can improve efficiency and quality of expanded services. 
PPP can improve revenue collection. PPPs can lead to timely completion of projects, of course, P by sharing risk between public and private s partners, which is very important. Don't rely on the private sector and don't rely on the government. It's both. It's a win-win situation. PPPs can mitigate risk associated with projects. Uh, example, the private sector can best handle operational financial market and completion risk will, will, while government are better placed to deal with political, contractual, macroeconomic and legal risks. So you see the sharing of such projects. Now, in terms of investment, return and risk, risk-adjusted return shows that infrastructure has the highest return among all class of assets globally. Okay, it is. Okay, if you say me, tell me, okay, this is in America, this is in Europe, this is whatever, not in Saudi Arabia. I'll tell you no, even in Saudi Arabia. Look at that chart, which is a calculation done by myself. Okay, if you look at the sector, the crude oil has nothing to do with us, okay, with the private sector. Okay, and the, uh, actually, the growth has been through the 20 years is one minus 1.6%. So nothing to do, to, to, we don't want to talk about crude oil. Okay, leave it alone. The non-crude oil industry, which means SABIC uh, and all the petrochemical downstream, upstream industries, has an income multiplier of 4.3, means every dollar goes to that sector, comes to the GDP as four times plus. Okay, the labor annual growth is the highest among the uh, sectors in GDP. It's 2.2% annual growth in demand for labor. The growth of the sector is 7.9%, which is in real terms, which is great growth rate that our GDP never achieved because we're depending on oil. All, all these great numbers for the uh, non-industrial petrochemical and uh, non-crude oil, uh, I mean non-crude oil industrial uh, sector, it is only 8% of our GDP as a percentage, unfortunately. Transport and communication, which is uh, included, including uh, Khaled here, <laughs> is also one of the top income multipliers, 4.5, although we don't have public transfer, transportation yet. What about if we have trains, uh, buses, all these things that take people? It will be a huge potential for the economy of the Saudi Arabia. Labor annual growth, it's 1.3% with the current deficiencies. But if we increase focus on the, uh, on the transportation sector, this number definitely will change. That's with all the deficiencies we have in the transportation sector. And uh, we still have a labor growth of one3 the growth rate of this sector is 5.9. You see, it's over 20 years, almost a uh, period of time uh, average. So that means these sectors have nothing to do with oil and its uh, volatility. Uh, it's very stable. It is almost, it's always positive and in high numbers. If we achieve that, we can do like China and India and all other countries, in addition to the oil efficiency and utilization of oil. Water, gas, and electricity, which is related to Mr. Ali al-Balraq, the income multiplier is 3.1, means every dollar that goes to the sector in power electricity gets the GDP $3.1 in return. Uh, the labor annual gas is only 1.7%, but it's high level standard of engineers, electricians, uh, technic technicians, all the jobs that we need to see for our sons and daughters. Okay? The growth rate is amazing, 6.1. Construction, which we are all here constructors and contractors, and we love landlords and, and real estate, is only, uh, the income multiplier is only 1.6. Real gives you 1.6%, which is under inflation rate. So your guy is having a negative return. Come and switch to industry and infrastructure. Labor annual growth is only 0.5. Whatever you go, retailers, and whatever you go, you real estaters, you will never create job for our sons and daughters. You need to be in the industry and the infrastructure to create jobs. Okay? Don't tell me the government deficiencies. We will work it out together. 
I know there are a lot of deficiencies, but we need to work it out together. And it happened. And I have examples to tell you if you want to ask me. The growth rate of that sector is only 2.2. So it's trivial regarding the other sectors. Commerce and tourism, which is a love of our people and businessmen, sorry to say that, it's, the income multiplier is only 1.2, so it's nothing, okay, with inflation and, and it's getting down and down the margins with the competition and the WTO. The labor annual growth is 0.7 only. Of course, if you increase your uh, trade, there is no creation of jobs and the job level is very low skills. Growth is 5.3% because that's the only sector uh, we are concentrating on. So PPP has, uh, in that slide, it shows that it reduces budget overruns. So the government will reduce budget overruns by 70% because it's like Ijar Muntahib Tamlik, leasing. They don't give the money for the contractor, just right ahead and do the project. They give it over 20, 30, 50 years, okay, period of time with when they assure maintenance and they assure everything going right and they, had, they can do, instead of doing one project, tens of projects. Okay, the time overruns, it's reduced by 60% as experience in the global world. Key challenges to PPP, strengthening legal, regulatory, and institutional framework of PPPs. Unfortunately, in Saudi Arabia, we still don't have this PPP unit. Everything is done on a special case for every ministry and every uh, government institution, and taking a lot of efforts and political support and a lot of mess with these uh, uh, nice presidents we have here to make it happen, and they have to create their own uh, strategy and whatever, but there is no main strategy for the kingdom, and this is the role of Ministry of Finance, and I hope Dr. Al-Assaf will take forward a step. I know he's doing a great effort to do privatization, but there is no way without a unit of PPP. Portugal, America, UK have different models, and our model should be custom tailored. We cannot copy American model, Russian model, or Chinese model. It needs to be custom tailored to our needs, our Islamic finance, because all this what you saw is, is the right Islamic finance, because it's asset back, leasing ended with ownership, and it is no I mean, uh, that the, rate, the debt ratio is just fantastic, as the Islamic said, and you can do bonds or what is called sukuk. So it's all Islamic about in the right, it is the right Islamic finance. It's the true Islamic finance, which gets you a lot of profits and a lot of sustainability, not the retail banking finance, which we are concentrating on. Put in place an effective communication strategy for PPP, distinguishing it clearly from privatization issues. PPP is not privatization. You cannot privatize water. It's a serious political sector. And electricity, it needs to be by, owned by the government, but you can make the private sector managing it. Addressing business planning, procurement, and implementation issues is also one of the challenges. Sorry. So, to conclude, PPP will absolutely unleash the kingdom's potential. And let 2001 be the start. Thank you. Now, Mr. Ali Barak, I know you have a lot of challenges with your private and public <laughs> partnership in your electricity company. Uh, I knew lately that, uh, if I may say, you've been Awarding projects as open cycle, why not combine cycle? Is financial restrictions a main reason? Or do you have other things? And please tell us about the successes you did in private in okay. PPP in so, the electricity sector. Okay, Sayyidatu Sadati Asad Allah Sabahikum Bikul Khair. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guest, it's my pleasure to be here just to talk about this very, very important future uh, project uh, and the trend. In fact, the term public-private partnership describes a range of possible relationship between the public or the governments and the private sector, mainly in the context of infrastructure and other services, as I mean. Uh, the private 
public partnership present framework that will engage the private sector, also acknowledge the, the social responsibility of the government. To have a strong partnership, in fact, while uh, Ms. Nahad, she covered most of what we're supposed to say about it. No, you, about this. you talk about electricity, please. <laughs> she, she covered, we need but, electricity. <laughs> but it is good just to share with you the, the power sector as a, as, a, as a very successful case of private and uh, government partnership. To be an effective uh, partnership normally should recognize the public and the private each have a certain advantage relative to other options perform to perform any certain project in, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this way of arrangement. The government contribution, contribution could be a, an asset and could be a, a direct investment while the private sector will utilize their expertise and their flexibility in managing these utilities and infrastructure besides the investment which they could, they could uh, put in this in these, uh, project. Normally, full of privatization, go to and be successful in a manufacturing process or a, a construction or similar activities, while the private-public partnership normally successful in a more utility and infrastructure based uh, kind of, of, of uh, business. In many countries where the government has a social concern responsibility, the, this kind of partnership is, is more, more, more successful and it is more needed. And in, in fact, it's sometimes it's a must. Many sectors could be, could be uh, I mean, it could be a successful case in the partnership between the private and the government. The power generation and distribution is one of them. The water and sanitation, the hospital and healthcare, and the public transportation, and many other uh, fields of infrastructure and service. But if you allow me to just uh, talk about the power sector experience in Saudi Arabia. Electricity industry starts in Saudi Arabia as 100% private sector, and it has been uh, created as a, as a private investment companies and run and owned by the private sector. Until the mid-70s from the last century, then the government decided, in fact, to reform the industry and to achieve three main goals. The first one, to electrify the whole country, regardless of the economic, of the, of the extension of the system to cover the whole villages and towns across the country. The second goal, to provide electricity to public with affordable price and to be unified across the country, while it was before it's different from region to region. The, the third goal is to run the business eff efficiently out of the government bureaucracy and, and to keep the private investors in the business and to continue the business. For this reason, four major companies have been created in, in, in Saudi Arabia in late 70s and early 80s, which we call them the Skikus. And all these small utilities companies has been consolidated in these companies and has been run as a joint between the private and the government. Uh, the government has been only as an investor and as a regulator. The companies has been run as a private, 100% private, with board of directors and with general assembly, and the government never interfered in the decision making of these companies and the government stay as a shareholder and a regulator, as I mentioned. This continues for some time, and it was, it was a successful case, but in 2001, all the utilities as a, a new structure has been 
consolidated in one company, which is the Saudi Electricity Company, as a credible company to be able to build the power infrastructure to meet the future expansion of the country. And the government goals has been completed during the last years, and there is an additional goal from this partnership that the employment of the Saudis, which reach up to 86% of the manpower working in the company are Saudis after they have been trained and taken care of the, of the job. Today, the Saudis, we have 25,000 Saudis working in the company. Fantastic. Most of them engineers, technicians, operators, and other supporting staff. The developers and investors from the private sector develop and operate the new plants today as a new uh, step to involve the private sector more. We create a program, we call it the Independent Power Producers, where we offered some generation projects to the developers and investors where they come and they invest in this uh, project and develop them and operate them. And the SEC and some other governments involved as a shareholders and as an off-taker for the power. And it was very successful. We already have three projects in operation today. We have two projects under construction, and we have another five projects. It's in the market. Some of them, some of them will come. The total investments of these projects, more than 20 billion U.S. dollars. Mr. Ali, you have only one minute. Time, okay. <laughs> I finished, okay. Yes. Uh, in fact, the... If we, let me just sum, summarize what's, what's okay. my view on this one. That's the private power, private and, and public partnership, in fact, could be a tool for a greater efficiency in running infrastructure and service. And we have the power sector as an example. And it's an opportunity to attract the private investor to come and invest. And it could be a catalyst for the future broader certain sector reforms and the privatization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ali. Thank you for them. Here we come. <laughs> Here we come to Saudi Airlines. <laughs> the hero of STC, and now he is uh, on the top of the Saudi Airlines. We know that Mr. Khalid Al Milham has done uh, uh, some successful stories in privatizing or PPP projects in uh, several sectors within Saudi Airlines. Uh, would you shed the light, please, on the obstacles and the successes? Not only the successes, Khaled, please. And let us know what deficiencies and what, how are you struggling with these deficiencies? <laughs> Thank you, Nahar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Sabah khair. Uh, first of all, I congratulate uh, Engineer uh, Barak because I think if there is any success story, it's in PPP. It's, it's actually in the electricity. Consistent, yes. and they have done a great job, and they continue to do a great job. On our side, it's less uh, of a story of PPP. It's more like uh, a story where the government have a lot of assets that either underperforming or not performing to promote growth in the sectors. In the Saudi airline case, we have uh, uh, a side of the, the well-known is the airline, which is the flying part, but we have a lot of it underneath, a lot of businesses that has been uh, there for a long time, but they have not been performing as well as we did. So when we uh, looked at it in 2006, we decided to see how we best we can get those assets performing through partnership with the private sector. Obviously, we had the issue and the doubt, should we go for the classic IPO market or should we go for uh, a partnership with, with the private sector? And we elected to, to go with the private partnership because there is a lot of, uh, a lot of value creation that have to take place before we move into another mode of, uh, of an asset sale. So it's important to identify those assets, and it's important to identify what do you want out of those assets? What do you want to do with them? How do you want to create the value from them? Uh, also, it was very important for us to identify a single project that will give us a confidence that we will do it when it's successful and will give us as, a, as, a, as an organization, our employee, as well as the, for the, with the investors, 
the confidence that we are serious, we can do it, and we can have a good partnership with the private sector. So let me just give you some criteria that we've gone through when we decided to, uh, uh, to identify the asset. First of all, is this asset ready? And from operational point of view, do we have enough financial in that organization to be able to present to investors? Uh, is there sufficient data to support this investment? Because investors will, will require a lot of data for them to make decisions. Uh, is it an attractiveness for investors? Is there a growth story? Is there a, uh, in the sector itself or it can grow in other sectors? Because some of those businesses are also not entirely an airline business. There are also businesses that can grow in other sectors. Uh, as I said, we, we made sure that the first one has to be a winner because it makes a big difference in our, in our criteria. Uh, then it's very important to identify who are the potential investors. Is it a financial investor? Is it a strategic investor? And, and here you cannot also but just say one because you may want to have a combination of both a technical and strong partner that might be a foreign investors with a local investors who are a financial partner and this is actually was a winning combination that we have worked with. Uh, you have to make sure that you provide them sufficient data and rich data because this is important for the value creation. If you don't give enough data you basically will not be able to sell at the right price because there will be no enough confidence on the, on the, issue, the uh, no, number that you would go. Uh, then you have to go through a process of pre-qualification. Uh, you have to do your, your homework of who, and you have to seek sufficient interest to start putting the, to the, 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 the evaluation of the investors and pre-qualification. As I said, be generous in, in providing data. Uh, accept few rounds of discussion with investors because it's important to see their views, what's their comments, and you have to share all of those comments with everybody because you want at the end of the day to have a level playing field for everybody who's investing with you. You don't want to give this guy this data and this guy this data. You share everything with them so that you can get a fair level field. At the end of the day, everybody has to bid on the same documentation that you are going to put together for investors. If you do not do that, you just basically will not be fair for, for everybody. Part of this as well is, uh, is uh, how you develop the agreements. Because when you sell asset, you're going to have to have share purchase agreement, you have to have some indemnities to the investors, you have to do uh, you know, technical agreement, you have to do the partner's agreement, uh, you have to, uh, in our case, we have a lot of a lot of dealing. Either we buy from the, those company or we sell to this company. So, how do you create the contracts between the, the offtake agreement between you and them? It makes a very big difference, and you have to make sure that you do it in a proper way. Where, first of all, you don't take you, you you're providing the right agreement, but also you're providing the right efficiency because you don't want to do it in a way you will basically pay whatever they want. You have to develop certain efficiency because the reason why you're doing it is because you want to get more efficient. Uh, and this is the case where we, when, when we do our catering business, we had a seven-year agreement with a deficiency target for them to reach. In the, in the cargo business, we had the other side. We sell them goods and services, and it makes a big difference in the way how, how to restructure the agreement. Uh, quickly. <laughs> uh, and in any case, uh, this is the, we have gone through a lot of those criteria, but... Uh, as I said, they also have to have a good bidding process because the bidding process makes a big difference in terms of how you do it. And what we did, we, we have the same level of agreement. We have one technical bid, then one, we have one financial bid, and we have an auction after that because this can create a lot of, a, a lot of an incentive. At the end of the day, you know, selling those assets is not necessarily just to raise cash is to improve efficiency and to provide also the sector for growth. When we do the MRO, which is our maintenance business, this will put the biggest maintenance activities in Saudi Arabia, which will promote growth in the aviation sector as a whole. So I hope that we, in, in maybe in the discussion we can go in more detail uh, on this. Again, one last point, the corporate governor, governance is very important. Those shareholders will require some reserve matters, some say on the business, 
and you have to ensure that you put that in place, otherwise you will not create a good value and, the, and, and it becomes uh, a situation where it will be difficult to manage when you go in, when you, you process that arrangement and you sell and you start managing. Thank you. Excuse me? We 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 sell we sell our uh, our airline as uh, subsidized, so <laughs> we have to make it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think that one of the biggest challenge, if you want to, it's actually at the end of the day, is actually is is the employee challenge. All of this oh, at yeah. the end of the day rests on how you manage your employee expectation efficiency, because the status quo has to change. And how you do that becomes the most difficult part. We'll come back to you in the, in the audience. Yellow. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, Mr. Richard McConnick, the executive vice chairman of Bank of America. And we are honored to have him with us today. Tell us about his experience and the difference between, I know you would like to shed the light then the, uh, the, between the difference of G7 and G20 and because that was raised yesterday. So, uh, and then you please give us uh, the fruit of your experience on PPP if you don't mind. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman and distinguished uh, members of the audience here. Uh, a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, my first visit to the Kingdom was when I was a young Treasury official in 1974, uh, and I came here as part of the joint U.S.-Saudi Economic Commission dealing with Abul Hale and Salman Saleem, uh, and, and I had a wonderful experience during that initial uh, period. Um, and in the intervening years, the one thing that has not changed in this country is the courtesy and hospitality of the Saudi people and the government, and for which I want to express my, my thanks. And this conference is, is another example of this, so I appreciate that. Um, concerning the, the, um, um, my own involvement, I, as, 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 as the, the moderator mentioned, uh, I've spent my entire life serving the American government uh, as an advisor to the top political leadership of the, of the United States at the White House, at the Treasury, at the State Department. Uh, I was sent over originally uh, to deal with the Saudi Arabian issues during the height of the oil crisis by President Ford. Um, and, and during these intervening years, I've tended to focus on the bigger issues that we faced as, as a country. Um, the, um, um, uh, I, I was taken yesterday uh, by the remarks, by the remar first the remarks of, of the governor of Sama about the G20 process. Uh, and the G7 process. And I was also taken by the, by the comments of President Villager of Switzerland where he basically said we run the danger of moving from a, from a, a, a deflationary situation into an explosive inflationary situation. And I just want to spend, uh, with your indulgence, uh, a couple of minutes addressing both of those issues. But first, a word about your, your public-private partnerships. Um, in preparation for this meeting, I obviously did a, a, num a lot of research. Um, I read the reports from the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD, the Government of Canada, uh, and it's very clear that there are thousands of these successful uh, public-private partnerships all over the world, and they are of infinite variety. Highway programs in Spain and Portugal, health care programs in Central America, educational programs elsewhere. Um, and there are spectacular examples of success, and there are spectacular examples of failure with these public-private partnerships. That, but the devil is always in the details. If the project is not well designed, if it is not well monitored, if expectations are not clearly spelled out, and if there's not clear transparency at all phases of this process, the project stands the possibility of not being successful and a, of an embarrassment to all parties. So it's very important that, that these projects be very well designed as, as you move forward, but the opportunities are absolutely clearly there. And what I'm simply going to do is I brought with me actually all these studies from the IMF, the World Bank, and I'm going to leave them with you um, because there are powerful lessons in them about how to avoid the problems and how to capitalize on the potential which is undoubtedly in these areas. So I, I leave that with you. Concerning the, the, the G20 uh, process, uh, um, the, um, I, I was the G7 Sherpa for old, for old Bush, good, the good President Bush that I, that I liked and respected so much in the, in the, in the early 1990s. Um, and we, I did a number of economic summits with, with, this, with this fine old gentleman. 
uh, for whom I have immense respect and, and deep, deep personal affection. Uh, he also was, of course, very knowledgeable about this part of the world, and he made an enormous effort to try to bring peace to this to this region, for which I give him immense credit. But the um, the but in the in the days of the G7. Um, one of the key functions of the G7 was to try to deal with the global imbalances that, that periodically developed in, in current accounts. Um, and in the case of, of, of the Plaza Agreement in 1985, uh, uh, when Mr. Baker did this as Secretary of the Treasury, we faced a growing current account problem in the United States. And it was very clear to us if we did not make a shift in the value of the dollar that we were going to wind up with a big problem. So we did the Plaza Agreement coordinating with the G7 process. Now, not everybody was happy about that, but the fact of the matter is when we did successfully do the devaluation of the dollar, it, it addressed the U.S. current account problem for 10 years. We did not have a current account problem that went beyond 2% of our GDP from 1985 to 1997. Um, and that was, that was directly as a, a result of the, of, the, of the Plaza Agreement and the process that took place. What happened in 1997, however, was uh, when you had the Asian financial crisis, the American guy, we faced a major global deflation problem because demand collapsed in Asia. It just collapsed. Uh, and so we basically stimulated the American economy to try to create more demand to prevent this deflation from taking place. And what happened after that, and that was the good idea, but the problem was they, they put their foot on the gas and they kept it too long and we wound up with a dot-com bubble and, and then later a housing problem. But the point I just want to make was the Plaza Agreement demonstrated that, current, that currency readjustments are absolutely important for dealing with current account adjustments. It's not the whole solution, it is not the only problem, but it is, it is an important problem. Uh, and the question one has basically now is it was obviously necessary to shift from the G7 to a, to a larger, broader format. But the problem we are having now with a the, with the larger, broader format, the interests are so diverse in this very large group that it's very difficult to get a consensus to do anything. And we, you saw recently in, with, the, with the G20 meeting in Korea, it accomplished nothing. Uh, so the, the danger is if you, it, but it is very important that we learn how to make the G20 be a success um, um, and, and to develop means of, of making this more effective as, a, as, a, as an operation. And it can be done, but it is going to require a learning process by all parties and a willingness of all parties to make some concessions for the sake of the, of the, of the success of the process. The, um, as you all know, the G7 process was, was, was at the spearhead for globalization. It was the spearhead for the WTO. It essentially created the conditions where emerging markets were able to play their growing role because it opened up capital, it opened up technology, it opened up markets. So the G7 process was not just about the seven countries. We tried to take consideration of the problems of the entire world as we had these quiet meetings to deal with these issues. And, and the, 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 uh, the G20 process also must look beyond the individual interests of specific countries to consider the, the importance of the whole. Because if we do not succeed in dealing, making the G20 process effective, one of three things will happen. Um, the, the, there will be uh, uh, disorder in the global financial system. Uh, there will be um, uh, a problem of, of, of a temptation to do unilateralization, or there will be even, even larger problems. Uh, for example, the failure to deal with the current account problems of, the, of the, the, the second Bush administration resulted in a net transfer of $2 trillion of wealth from the United States out. We can't continue with bleeding capital at that, at, that, at that pace. So we have got to address the current account issue. And to do that, it is very, very important that we have the cooperation of other countries, including China. This, uh, this, uh, this last summer, the, um, the, Bush administra the, the Obama administration did a major, major national security exercise where they reviewed the dangers to the United States over the, over the, in the 10 years ahead of us. Um, when, they be, when they address the national security threats to the United States, the first threat and the most serious one was not terrorism. It was not China. The first threat to the United States was debt, failure to manage debt. And there were two aspects to this debt. One was the current account problem. 
uh, and the other one was the, the, uh, the fiscal debt building up in the United States. Well, the Obama administration, to its great credit, immediately organized a national commission with Erskine Bowles and Senator Simpson to address the fiscal issues. And this is something that you all cannot deal with. It is, it is important for the United States to deal with. And this last election that we had was basically an election over how to deal with the debt problems of the United States. Mr. Richard, sorry yes. to cut you, but you have to wrap right. up. <laughs> right. so, but, but, but please, Mr. Richard, uh, uh, please, if you should like that, one size doesn't fit all. I can't hear you. One size doesn't fit all. I what, mean, what? one size doesn't fit all. I mean, your model of PPP yes. cannot apply <laughs> Exactly you know, on as I say, the, the <laughs> to get back to our PPP issue here, this dear lady, uh, no. I, I just will say that that there is, there is there, there's an infinity of models of, of the of these uh, for these public-private programs, an infinity of, of models, and as I say, they deal with everything from education to health care to highways to hospitals. The in, there's an infinity of possibilities, but as I say, beware of the devil, which is in the details. And, and that is why I leave with you this interesting little analysis here, which you can review in your leisure. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richard. And now, last but not least, our UK expert, Mr. Oakland. Uh, if you like, please, to uh, shed the light on your experience within the UK about PPP and how do you want us to uh, learn the lesson. Shukran jazeelan nader wa assalamu alaikum wa shukran jazeelan li da'watikum al karima li hadhihi al muntada jidda al iqtisadi al muhim. Thank you very much for uh, calling me a Middle East expert. I think it's one of the nicest things that anyone has ever said about me. Um, I've uh, sort of during my day job, I, I run our. Um, government department which is responsible for uh, British trade and investment and uh, as, uh, as Nada said I sort of uh, had a career in the Middle East before that. The very first time actually I came to Jeddah it was um, three years after Dick uh, and in 1977 when the uh, old Corniche was still being constructed and I had the uh, privilege of uh, running a small factory making glass reinforced concrete on uh, at, uh, Kilo 33 between Jeddah and Mecca and um, when periodically people say to me what are the things that you're most proud of in your life I've got there is a, a mosque that I gather is still standing in Mecca I can't of course go there but there's a mosque that's standing in Mecca that was made at uh, our little factory at Kilo 33. So uh, since then, I've always had a special sort of place in my heart for your great city, and uh, so thank you very much for inviting me back here. We've heard from the, um, the, the previous speakers in, in great detail about what are the big uh, opportunities and challenges which come from PPP, and one of the disadvantages of going last is that if you're not careful you just you end up repeating what others have said so I think I mean I, I'll, I'll just if I may spend 30 seconds on on if you like PPP narrowly defined simply to really endorse what uh, uh, both um, uh, Mr. El Mulham and uh, Mr. Al Barak and, and, and Dick McCormack have just said I mean there is an immense amount of experience that's sitting in London, which arguably is the second financial city in the world, sorry Dick, not after New York, but after Riyadh, and, um, sorry, uh, but uh, the, I mean, we've, we've done PPP over many years, uh, some of it, frankly, has worked really well, I mean, if, we, if one looks at it overall, the PPP projects have worked out something like 30% cheaper, uh, more efficient, uh, delivered more on time than ones done entirely through uh, public procurement. But you do really have to fit the circumstances of the project to uh, the particular financing method. And it works better for some projects, particularly with longer timelines, than it does with others. Um, for example, if one's trying to procure uh, an ICT system where the uh, 
life is much shorter. On the whole, PPP works less well there. It's, it's better on when you're doing schools and hospitals and, and, and road systems and so forth. And really doing your, your due, due diligence, getting the corporate governance right, getting the, um, the, the management, the performance management right um, is absolutely central. I wanted also, if I could though, to talk just a little bit about what one might call PPP slightly more broadly defined in terms of the uh, partnership between the state and the private sector. Because I, mean, I think there is a question that faces both our economies and we, we have an enormous requirement for public investment in the UK I and mean, it's something like uh, 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 500 billion pounds over the next uh, uh, 10 years and financing that will be really important in delivering it on time. But also we have a really important task in delivering jobs. And we heard yesterday that you know, just like there are big infrastructure uh, opportunities in Saudi Arabia, so there's an enormous challenge over jobs, something like uh, 6 million jobs I think we, over the next 20 years was the figure. What is going to create those jobs, whether it's in the UK or in Saudi Arabia? Arguably, it's not these very large infrastructure projects, it's the SMEs. If in the UK we could create one job, just one job, for every, extra, for every SME in the country, we would wipe out unemployment at a stroke. And if one looks back over the last six years in the UK, half half of our new jobs were created by 5% of our companies and they were SMEs and they were very high growth and very productive and it's how you get at those 5% of, of companies and really encourage them that is enormously important I think. How do you identify them? How do you then persuade them to export? When one talks to these small companies, be it in uh, the UK or uh, I suspect in Saudi Arabia. Some of them are exporting already, about a third of ours do. Some of them are absolutely determined not to export. They think the exchange rate risk is too great. They don't really want to take the risk of uh, exporting, abroad, of working abroad. But then about a third of them actually just don't have the knowledge to be able to do it. Uh, We've heard a lot yesterday, rightly, about the opportunities in Asia, and they are enormous. But to ask an SME in Saudi Arabia or in the UK to go straight to uh, exporting to China is really difficult. It's a really hard ask. And so how does one take them along that, that curve? And how do you persuade them to take risk? And here I think I would go back to uh, what we were talking about yesterday in terms of education. It's not just about qualifications. It's not just about what you come out of university with or uh, further education, though that is enormously important. It's how do we, in the UK, in Saudi Arabia, fr frankly, pretty well across the world, how do we get our children to think from the time they're growing up about the, to get them into the mindset to take risk and to become uh, uh, entrepreneurs, whether they do PPP narrowly defined, whether they do uh, broader projects. Some of our most successful businessmen in the UK started with $250 in the back of a garage, working from the back of a garage, and they worked up from there. But actually convincing our children in school that that is the sort of thing that one should be aspiring to do. Not becoming a diplomat, not becoming a government official, not becoming uh, a, uh, uh, going into a, an enormous company, but actually getting into a startup and driving it through is really important. And then there's a really important role for government, not just in educating, but then in joining up the uh, SME with its potential market, with providing it with access to capital, Providing it with venture capital, when you're an SME, how often do you know where to go to an angel investor or to a, a, a venture capital company, for example, in California? I mean, it's a different world, and somehow the private and the public 
need to come together in ways that arguably we haven't before. PPP narrowly defined, the big, the big infrastructure projects, it's really important for both of our countries and we will need to do that and we'll need to learn the lessons. But I think the one uh, other point I would uh, leave with you, if I may, is that we need to think about PPP more widely defined and how for our SME sector we, if you like, the governments, can work with the private sector right through the chain from primary school through school through, edu uh, through further education to deliver the sorts of people and the mechanisms which will join up small and medium-sized enterprise with really good jobs and that will then drive uh, both of our economies uh, going forward. Thank you very much Sorry, indeed. Thank you for really commenting on the job creation and how important is it and the cluster of industries after PPP uh, big projects and this is really the key to growth. Uh, thanks everybody. I'd like really to thank our panelists for their great participation and collaboration to, to shed the light among uh, the, uh, their, uh, I mean, diversified experience on PPP. And now we'd like to leave the uh, stage for the audience. Yes, please. Hello, uh, my name is Ayad Mohammed Mshayikh. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I have two questions. Question number one uh, is uh, for in engineer Ali al -Barraq. Uh, actually, Mr. Edward mentioned clearly about uh, the SMEs. When we can see the initiative from uh, Saudi Electrical Company about giving projects for uh, small and medium uh, companies. Uh, as we know, in the US and the UK, uh, a number of percentage of major projects goes uh, to small businesses. Uh, my second question is of uh, Mr. Um, uh, Khaled al Milham. Uh, we want to know about the case study of uh, the privatization of uh, the Saudi uh, catering company. Lately, we noticed that there is a big change and downgrade on the services on uh, the Saudi catering company, especially they are using um, a third party of an international company serving, uh, serving foods uh, on some of the flights in Saudi Airlines, especially on snacks. Why we don't see Saudi companies or... Um, Quickly, yeah, please. Sorry. Quickly. <laughs> Why we don't see Saudi uh, companies uh, uh, serving those products instead of uh, uh, importing uh, those uh, products from international countries, especially from South Asia? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Definitely, uh, SEC is, is open all the projects for all the pre-qualified contractors, regardless of the, of the size. But uh, as you know, the, the power sector is facing a, a time concern on performing the project. But today we have more than 2,000 contractors working today on the project. <laughs> uh, definitely most of them small and medium and, and big contractors. We have a processing of pre-qualifying the contractors. Once he's reached the, the, the level of pre-qualification to a certain level of a project, definitely some IPP projects, it needs a financial capability and financial uh, <laughs> relation with the, with the financing institution because these projects are 80-20. It's 80 uh, debts and 20 uh, equity and that needs uh, uh, quite a strong, credible investors and developers uh, to be, uh, mainly the developers to be, to be uh, uh, has a strength with, with the, but it's open for all the contractors and we are doing it today. Thank you, Mr. Ali. Mr. Khalid? Well, well, I, one of the most difficult things is to, to satisfy everybody's taste. Even in your home, when you put your food, you cannot guarantee that everybody in the house would like the same type of food. So I take your comment, we will look into it, but it's very difficult to comment on an actual taste. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. McCormick, uh, please, Richard McCormick. And uh, with your permission, Madam uh, Moderator, I'd like to veer off just from PPP. Uh, Mr. McCormick mentioned briefly that uh, America's greatest threat was its debt. Uh, and, you know, we're all aware of the debt bomb, so to speak, that, that America is facing. Of course, this calls for a certain monetary and, and uh, 
economic policy for the United States to follow in order to handle that. Now, Saudi Arabia is in a completely opposite situation where we're enjoying good revenues, uh, hardly any government debt and, and, and great reserves. But our currency is tied to the dollar. So how do you see that going to the future? And if, uh, what would you advise uh, our uh, uh, economists and our authorities how to handle what are the, the, the future challenges that are going to face us if we certainly we have to kind of follow the United States in terms of interest rates, things like that. Uh, our issues are different here, but our currency is tied to the dollar. What are we going to uh, have to deal with in the future and what would you advise our authorities to, to look out for? Thank you, Mr. Adam. Well, the, um, right now, as you, uh, as you well know, the world is in incredible turmoil. Um, we've, we've just had a major G7 intervention to try to stabilize the Japanese currency, which is facing catastrophic issues related to, uh, to uh, earthquake and, and, and nuclear problems and, and the, the rush of capital, which is being brought back into Japan to begin to address some of those issues and the results with the currency. So right now, you're, and, and, and in the case of Europe, um, there are enormous problems related to, to sovereign debt issues and the banking issues that are connected to that. So when one is, so we're dealing with a world which is in flux right now. So if I were advising the government of Saudi Arabia, I basically would say, don't make any major changes in your current situation until it's clear what the future long-term trends are going to be. Will the U.S. in fact get control of its of its fiscal problems? My guess is it will. Um, will the Europeans eventually find solutions to their debt problems? My guess is it will. Will the Japanese eventually deal with the issues where, where, where they're dealing with, with, with it uh, and, and get back on a, on a bit of a growth track again? My guess is they will. Will the Chinese eventually find some way of stimulating enough domestic demand so that they're less reliant on international things? And, and will their currency make those adjustments? My guess is they will. But those are all questions for the future. So as I say, my, my advice to you now is don't do anything for uh, and the next uh, months or so uh, until we see how the world begins to emerge from its current uncertainties. But Mr. Richard, if I may intervene here, please, that uh, currently our import basket is only 12% from America, and we have expanded massively uh, to import from Europe, China, India, and whatever. And even our oil exports are not going to America as much. It's going to the east. So both, and still our uh, oil is priced in oil, and uh, our oil is priced on dollar, and our revenues are, are linked to the dollar, although none of our exports and imports are seriously linked to the dollar. So being stable means high inflation, means a lot of complications coming to our uh, industry and our economy. How do you want to uh, reply to that? Well, I just would make the observation that, uh, that a, a couple of years ago when the, when the, uh, when the uh, euro was at a very strong position, mm. many people shifted. Some people began to shift their reserves into euro, and then, of course, the euro dramatically weakened. So they basically suffered. And the, the point I just would make to you is, you know, on, in terms of the long term, we have to take a look at what the structure of the world is going to look like. But my advice to you now is please don't make decisions given when you've got all the turmoil because you will lock yourself into a situation which you may find disadvantageous. Mm -hmm. So be a bit patient until we see how the world begins to emerge from these issues, and then you'll see the new structure of the world, and then you can make your decisions accordingly. Okay. Um, okay. Sabah al khair, Dr. Nahed. Sabah al khair. I am very pleased to see you where you are. Thank you. Uh, actually, actually, I would like to have uh, uh, more uh, time to address the issue of. Uh, uh, the electricity and Saudi airline. Uh, my name is Saeed Al Ghamdi, and I'm a specialist in the air transport industry, and uh, uh, it's severe. Uh, the way I look at these two sectors, the electricity and the uh, air transport, uh, is, is this. I think the, with the electricity, we have uh, a lot of success and also a lot of uh, Public, uh, 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 public acceptance of the services and happiness about it to a certain level. There is always room for improvement. 
but as far as the uh, air transport and, Quickly, main, and mainly the airline mainly the airline i think the uh, the lack of uh, the, the the services that public is getting uh, is not up to the level that is uh, required now private privatization uh, for me means uh, more efficient, less cost, better service, uh, provide more jobs, uh, and added value to the GDP. Now, I think we, while doing all these things, we should not lose sight of providing better services. Otherwise, we will lose our market share, and once, yes. once our market share is lost, in the air transport industry, it is very difficult to get it back. So your question is to uh, Khaled? So my, my question to, uh, to uh, Mr. Al-Milhim is this. Uh, I think you are doing uh, a great job, but uh, uh, I'm not sure whether you are losing sight of the importance of the level of services <laughs> that are, uh, provi should be provided uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in favor of uh, what you try to transform the industry into uh, a, a private sector. Wrap up, please, uh, 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 <laughs> Into a private sector. So what is your comment on this level of service that is uh, declining? Thank you. Thank you for the question. First of all, uh, you have to look at the air transport as a system. Uh, it's not only the airline. It's it's the airports as the infrastructure and their, how good they are to be able to, to, to provide a service. And what airline do you want to be? You want to be a, a, a hub airline serving international or are you a, an airline like Saudi Airline where most of your activities, 73% of our flying every day is local flying for 26 airport, 93 bearing a day, and every flight you take and every seat you put, you lose money on it because it's subsidized. And it's not subsidized where the airline is getting cash injection for the subsidy. So basically what's, your hap what's happening here is you are flying international, you're making a little bit of money there, you're doing Umrah and, 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 and Hajj and you're making a little money, and you lose all of it and more in providing local services. And as you know, when the sector was deregulated and we had two airlines came in, none of them succeeded because of this price cap. So it's, it's yes, it, is, it has to do with also the profitability of the sector. When you provide a losing service, it's impossible to have the best possible service on earth. So you have to address this as a fundamental issue for the airline to grow. You have a large country, you have population growth, you have large demand on your services. If you continue to make it as a, a loss maker, it's very difficult to make, to make this, uh, this uh, ends meet. If, and on top of it, you're dealing with sister or a neighboring country that have elected to have large airport, elected to put huge sum of money on, on their a fleet elected they have no local transportation all they do is bring east west and that's it and you're basically also giving them allowed them a lot of traffic into saudi arabia where they're sucking a lot of traffic on a very low fare basis which makes it even more difficult so you have to have a national policy what do you want to have you want to have a hub airport in jeddah or you want to have an airport in riyadh and if that's the case, what do we all need to do to, to make them successful? And it's not very difficult. Give a put a right airport, put the money that necessary in the, in the, uh, the fleet you do. And by, by the way, you have plenty of traffic rights in Saudi Arabia that not been utilized and which we can utilize and we can make them. But you have to make this as a, a national objective and you have to fund it and make sure that you know this is going to be a long-term not a short term. Obviously, this will generate a lot of growth and job in the maintenance areas and a good quality job. And this is what, what you need to do. The second important thing 
in Saudi Arabia that we need to capitalize in is not really the, the person who comes into the airport and leave the airport in two hours. What we need to capitalize is the person who comes and spend two to three days in Saudi Arabia. Come for an Umrah, spend money, generate growth, rather just come and, you know, from an airport to, uh, back to another country. And we have a great potential. We have a great potential. There's a build out in Mecca and Medina today. You could have easily 20 to 30 million a year visitors instead of three and a half to four million a year visitors. And if you do that, then automatically you're going to have the best hopping activity in the world rather than, and it will be the most profitable as well for the country as a whole. Assalamu alaikum, bismillah rahman rahim. Dr. Zuhira Sibai. Alhiyana, I would like to speak in Arabic for more than one reason. تفضل السبب الاول انه اللغه العربيه قادره على التعبير على نفسها السبب الثاني انه اغلب الموجودين عرب يمكن 95% منهم السبب الثالث انه توجد ترجمه فوريه والسبب الرابع والاخير والاهم انه لربما استطعنا ان نترجم ما قيل في هذا المؤتمر الى ارض الواقع والذين سيترجمونه الى ارض الواقع هم عرب وسيسهل عليهم النقاش والحوار والكتابه والقراءه باللغه العربيه طيب. هذا الاساس انا ارجو ان تكون لغه المؤتمر هي اللغه العربيه طيب. سؤال لك الاخت ناهد انا وجبت كثير بطرحك شكرا وحبيت اسال سؤال يمكن اهم مجالين لنا في المملكة هما التعليم والصحة فهل هناك وسيلة للشراكة بين الحكومة والقطاع الخاص وهل هناك نماذج ناجحة لهذه الشراكة في مجالي التعليم والصحة شكرا شكرا لك الحقيقة آه للآن لم ينفذ مشروع واحد في مجالات التعليم والصحة أز أز كشراكة بين القطاع العام والخاص كلها إما حكومية أو خاصة بحتة ونحن نطمح الآن بتصريحات الملك والقرارات الملكية اللي صدرت من الملك عبد الله حاليا بإنشاء مستشفيات وكذا أن تنفذ كشراكة بين القطاعين العام والخاص لأن القطاع الخاص مستشفياته بتكون غالية ومكلفة جدا على الفرد العادي أو متوسط الدخل أما القطاع العام فالخدمات للأسف متدنية وغير متوفرة وأكاد أكون أقول منعدمة في مجالات كثيرة فبالتصريحات الملكية الأخيرة للاستفادة أكثر من المبالغ التي يطرحها الملك عبد الله في إنشاء مستشفيات كبيرة الآن و... والأهم من ذلك في الوقت الحالي أن يعطى كل مواطن سعودي وأتمنى أن يصل ذلك إلى أبو متعب إن health insurance لأن الكثير هناك من يعاني من الأفراد السعوديين من عدم الوصول إلى المستشفيات حتى يتم إنشاء المستشفيات وأن تعطى أن توضع, أن توضع أيضا هناك صناديق trust تستثمر وعوائدها تعطى لمن لا يستطيع أن يدخل إلى المستشفيات الخاصة شكرا لكم آه 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 نعم هناك حاجة في القطاعين هؤلاء بالذات ما زالت ليس هناك أي شراكة بين القطاع العام والخاص وأنا أتمنى أن أكون كبنك استثماري أول المشاركين في هذه المشاريع وأن أعطي الكثير لنجاح هذه المشاريع شكرا لك شكرا جزيلا صباح الخير أنا الكونسول العام البريطاني في جدة كيت رود أوكي شكرا My question is for Edward Oakden, Director, Global Markets in UK Trade and Investment. Um, as we all know, Saudi Arabia has uh, a particularly skewed population with 60% of the population under 21, with all the employment um, concerns that that clearly uh, arises. With an, un with an eye on the unrest in the region and the clear importance of young people feeling part of, the, of their own country's economy, how can the UK's long experience in PPP and startups be brought to bear here in the kingdom with British expertise helping our Saudi friends? Thank you, uh, Mr. Auckland. Thank you, thank you, Kate. I mean, I think with all, all sort of due humility, I would say, I mean, London is, is full of 
experts, both British and, and non-British, who have spent many, many years uh, doing this. And as you know, some of us have said earlier, both for good and for bad, there have been a, a, a huge number of uh, projects uh, uh, right across the world, many of them in uh, Dick's very impressive folder. Um, and some of them have worked and been really successful. And frankly, in the UK, we couldn't have done uh, nearly as much as we've done without PPP. It's been an enormous uh, uh, success for us, but also, frankly, quite a journey. Um, if one looks at what we did kind of when we started out with this 20 years ago to where we are now, it's, we do it in a very different way. And uh, as we were saying earlier, I mean, I think really trying to understand the nature of the individual project and then how the financing can be adapted to the nature of that project um, is really important and that uh, in terms of how we bring in our young people for that uh, I think it's it's there's, there's a real challenge certainly for the British government and perhaps for others too about how we design these very large projects that are important in the UK, are clearly going to be important in the Kingdom, such that we don't just bring in sort of foreign uh, experts or we don't just bring in you know, a few investment banks to do it. We need to find a way of bringing in our uh, SMEs, our smaller companies, for example, into our larger procurement contracts. If you're sitting in government and you're trying to procure nine new hospitals, in many ways it's much easier to go to one big provider and say, you know, build me nine hospitals and, bu and bu build a consortium and, and bring in your operators and your uh, suppliers and so forth. That de-risks it for the government. Well, that's fine, but actually it doesn't help all of the small and medium-sized enterprises who are uh, providing those supplies, who are quite capable of doing the operating, who can uh, do a little bit of the supply chain. And I think one of the tasks of government, certainly in the UK, is how can we help the private sector to build the sorts of consortia for PPP projects that won't just involve with respect the big companies, but will really try and bring in and make a big effort to bring in, because it's not easy to bring in these smaller companies and to, to get them up to the sort of level of performance that they will need to do if they're to meet the performance requirements that are rightly part of these projects. It's a big challenge, but it's really, really important if we're to get the employment consequences, in other words, to, to drive up employment amongst our young people, and not just give them jobs, but give them really rewarding jobs that I think we all agree is really important for our young people going forward. Mr. Auckland, if I may comment on what you said, I really uh, appreciate what you said. And from my experience personally in our bank, the, and we learned a lot from the UK model because the US model is more of uh, control to the private sector, while the, the UK model is more of the government control. And in our stage, I believe the UK model is much more relevant in some cases to our situation. However, we found out through, uh, through dealing with the majority of the sector, the public sectors in our PPP project, that there, re there is really a huge need for collaboration among international advisors and local know-how. Yeah. Without that, the international advisors will very much price high the risk in the project. So paving the way from the local knowledge is very important to the success as Mr. Uh, Richard said, the devil is in the details. So the, for the success of privatization or PPP projects in the kingdom, the combination is really essential to make the international experience and the local know-how. I mean, if, if I may just say, I really strongly yeah. agree with that. And I think it's very important, if I, if I might offer just one word of advice, it's that when, you, when you, you're letting these large projects and you have international advisors in, have people who really know the kingdom and who can re have got long relationships with people here 
Uh, there are some British, lots of, lots, uh, lots of others too, but people who really know the, um, uh, the subject matter, because I completely agree with you, that's what will bring the best results, that's what experience suggests. Dr. Ihab Suleimani, Mandis Khalid Al-Milhim. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته طلعتنا الصحف في الأيام السابقة عن وفاة طيار سعودي على حد حلمي أن نظام الياتا ينص على أن الناقل الجوي لابد أن يجري كشف طبي للطيار قبل صعود لأي رحلة آمل التوضيح منكم أنا دكتور في عضو منظمة العفو الدولية والمنظمة العربية لحقوق الإنسان والمهندس علي البراك ألا يرى أنه من العدالة تعويض المشتركين في حال انقطاع الكهرباء لا سيما وأن الكهرباء تفرد التدرج في التعرفة على مستوى الاستهلاك شكرا تفضل خالد <تصفيق> أولا هناك نظام ل... 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 لتراخيص الطيارين وجزء منه هو الوضع الصحي لكل طيار والكشف المطلوب اللي يصير في المستشفيات المتخصصة بفريق طبي متخصص وعلى أساسها تعطى الشهادة السنوية التي يحصل عليها الطيار من جهتين رئيستين هي الهيئة الطيار المدني والفي اي في امريكا وجميع طيارين الخطوط السعودية وجميع الطيارين الذين يعملون في المملكة يخضعون لنفس النظام موتة كابتن ب ب ولا نرقى بنتكلم عن عنه لان هذه حالة الشخصية ولا ولا اعتقد انه من العقل ان احنا نتكلم عنها في 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 بابليك دومين شيء يحدث ولا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ولكن جميع الطيارين يخضعون إلى نظام محدد وصارم بالنسبة للكشف الطبي الذي في النهاية يتعلق برخصته أو سحب رخصته ولدينا العديد من الطيارين اللي نسحب رخصتهم بسبب وضعه الطبي الصحي اللي نكتشفه أثناء الفحوصات الطبية أستاذ علي لو سمح سريعا بلا شك يعني اشكرك على السؤال لانه الاساس في الخدمه لا تنقطع وان تكون مستمره لان طبيعه خدمه الكهرباء اليوم اصبحت يجب ان لا تنقطع المشكله اللي تعانيها مثل الشركات اللي ريجليتد ومثبته التعرفه وفيها تكافل ما بين التعرفه لبعض الفئات والتعرفه المفضله لكن في المتوسط هي اقل مما يكفي لمزيد من الاستثمارات للتقليل من الانقطاعات حينما تكون الانقطاعات يعني ناتجة عن يعني أسباب الشركة يعني هي المتعمدة فيوجد في العالم أنظمة لتعويض مثل هالحالات في حالة أن الانقطاع يكون لأطراف خارجية أو لأسباب يعني خارجة فلا يوجد الآن في العالم تحت أي ريجيليشن موجودة في العالم أن يعوض المشترك كونسيكونسز عن انقطاعا يكون خارج عن إرادة الشركة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بعدين رقم ثلاثة الدكتورة نورة خالد السعد سؤالي حقيقة للأستاذ خالد الملحم بالنسبة للخطوط السعودية طالما هي شراكة ما بين الدولة والقطاع الخاص فكنا نتوقع أن يكون مستوى الخدمات مستوى متميز للأسف لن أبالغ إذا قلت أن يمكن 80% 70% من رأي الجمهور عن خدمات الخطوط السعودية غير مرضية وحتى هناك نكتة إذا انتهت الرحلة داخلية وقالوا شكرا لاختياركم الخطوط السعودية الغلبية يقول مجبرون <تصفيق> ما عدا خطوط ناس وسماء وأيضا هي لم تنجح في تحقيق التقديم الخدمات المرضية خصوصا الآن خطوط السعودية رفعت من أسعار الأفق تذاكر الأفق والدرجة الأولى ووزعتها على مستويات نوع الخدمة لم يتغير هو هو فما هو رأيكم في كيف يمكن حقيقة أن تكون الخطوط السعودية نموذج لخطوط تقدم أحسن الخدمات خصوصا أنك تحدثت عن 30 مليون حاجة ومعتمر يزور المملكة شكرا أول شيء لا يمكن أنك تحكم على خدمة إذا ما في بديل لها ومنافس لها أنا أتمنى أن يكون عندنا في قطاع النقل الجوي عشر خطوط وليست الخطوط السعودية لأنه هو في النهاية اللي أول شيء يدعك في المنافسة من أهم العناصر لتحسين الخدمة وثانيا من أهم العناصر لإعطاء المستفيد الخيار في الخدمة 
في نفس الموقع اللي كنت فيه قبل في الاتصالات يوم كانت الخطوط يوم كانت الاتصالات الوحيده لم يكن يرضى على خدمتها احد يوم جاءت المنافسين العدد منكم كلكم لا زالت عندكم خطوط الاتصالات السعوديه لم تنتقلوا الى الى مشغل جديد وضعنا في الـ في الـ في الـ في, الـ في الـ النقل الجوي مع الاسف وضع يعتمد على ناقل واحد وينقل 85% من ركابه اللي هم في الدرجه السياحيه بخساره اذا لم يحل هالموضوع هذا فلن يكون هناك مشغلين اخرين لانه ما حد يجي يحرق فلوسه في ال... وال... و... على اساس ينقل ركاب ب... ب... بخساره وهذا ما صار لشركه سما جاوا واشتغلوا عدد من السنين وفي النهايه حرقوا لهم 700 800 مليون ريال وانتهت خدمتهم. القطاع يحتاج الى اعاده النظر في موضوع الاسعار، الاسعار في 16 سنه مثبته. انتم تعرفون اليوم انه ما في سلعه في البلد من 16 سنه ظلت بنفس السعر. التكاليف الطائرات زادت، تكاليف الخدمه زادت، الموظفين اللي كانوا قبل 16 سنه رواتبهم تختلف اليوم. فالقطاع هذا يحتاج الى الى اعاده النظر في كيفيه تقديم الخدمه، اذا لم يكن تقديم الخدمه مطلوبه بالسعر هذا فلازم يكون النظره في عمليه كيف دعمها. لأن زي ما قلت لا يمكن أنك تشتري أسطول متكامل وتلبي الخدمة وأنت خسران هذا شيء اللي يجب أن نحن نكون صادقين مع نفسنا هل نحن مقدمين خدمة نحن نعمل على أن نحن نقدم أحسن مستوى خدمة في يدنا في الوقت الحاضر أسطول جديد 45 طيارة جديدة الأسطول القديم المتهالك اللي كان عمره أكثر من 28 سنة تخرجناه من الخدمة نتأمل إلى يكون عندنا مطار في في جدة بعد التعديلات مطار يكون يخدمنا اليوم على أساس نركب طيارة واحدة من الرياض إلى جدة نأخذ ست باصات عشان نوصل الراكب هل هذا تقديم خدمة جيدة؟ لا ما هو تقديم خدمة بس هذا المطار اللي نتعامل فيه فلذلك هي منظومة متكاملة تتعلق باقتصاديتها وكذلك المنافذ اللي تتعامل فيها ونتأمل إن شاء الله أن احنا نجد حلول للموضوع هذا لتطور القطاع الطيران قطاع الطيران قطاع مهم بالنسبة 30 مليون اللي تكلمنا عنها هذا البوتنشل وليس في الأرض الواقع شكرا خالد بس خالد معناه أنه يشد أرجو مع دكتور إبراهيم العساف على التضخم إذا بنقول ارتفاعات في الأسعار وهذا واقع هذا واقع ارتفاعات في الرواتب ارتفاعات في الأسعار ارتفاعات في الخدمات ارتفاعات في الاستيراد حتى اسعار كل شيء يعني بيجينا اغلى فاعتقد انه لازم وي ارجو الدكتور العساف تو ادجست انفليشن الموضوع <تصفيق> الموضوع محل بحث بحث في بالنسبه للقطاع الطيران والفتح الموضوع جدي يبحث فيه أيوة في 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 مجلس الاقتصاد الاعلى وهناك حلول ينظر لها في الوقت الحاضر لتفعيل القطاع هذا لانه القطاع هذا قطاع واعد ومهم ويجب ان احنا ننظر للترانسبورتيشن سيكتور ما هو فقط كترانسبورتيشن سيكتور للطيران اتس انتجريتد لما تفتح المدينه آه المدينه جده كقطار كيف حد سعره مقابل رحله المدينه 120 ريال صحيح فاذا ما تنظر للقطاع هذا كانتجريتد سيكتور حتجد نفسك قاعد تسوي اشياء آه تقدم نفس الخدمة ولكن بطريقة مختلفة وممكن زيادة تعباء على الطرفين في العملية صحيح آه، نسمي هشام الدباغ بزنس انتربنور آه، تجاوبا مع مطالب الدكتور زهير السباعي الثلاثة سأنتقل إلى اللغة العربية على الرغم أني حضرت سؤالي باللغة الإنجليزية آه، الحقيقة أشكر يعني القائمين على اختيار الاسم آه، المحاضرة هذه اللي هو أعتقد أنه يمس حديث ال المدينة أو حديث الدولة اللي هو يختص بالقرارات الأخيرة وبودي طبعا من ضمن القرارات الحكيمة الأخيرة اللي هي تتعلق بخلق فرص العمل ومحاربة البطالة اللي سماها الشيخ صالح كامل جدة الكبائر يعني كان من ضمن الأشياء اللي ذكرت واعذرني يعني إذا كان في مصطلح أو اثنين ما حاقدر أترجمهم وتسعفنا الاقتصادية المرموقة الدكتورة ناهد إنها يعني ترجمها ولا كان من ضمن القرارات خلق ستين ألف وظيفة في القطاع الأمني
اعتقد انه هذه مهمه لخلق مناخ اقتصادي سليم انه يكون عندنا يعني وظائف امنيه بهذا العدد الملاحظ انه البوليس بير كابيتا عندنا اصبح عالي جدا فهل هذا مؤشر والسؤال لك يا دكتور هل هذا مؤشر يعني اقتصادي مهم انه يكون البوليس بير كابيتا از ريليتيفلي هاي كومبيرينج تو تو يعني او مقارنه بالدول الاخرى بس هذا سؤالي والله انا من وجهه نظري وبصراحه انه المفروض يكون السكيورتي جاي من محاربه الفقر محاربة الفقر هي العلاج الأساسي لأي أمن أنا مع الملك في أنه يزيد البوليس يزيد السيكوريتي بكوز الأحداث اللي حاصلة حوالينا لكن السيكوريتي الحقيقية تيجي من خلق وظائف إحنا لعلمك بعام 2020 نطلب من ليونين وخمسمية ألف وظيفة قدرتنا الحالية على خلق وظائف لو استمرينا بالوضع الحالي هي 400 ألف وظيفة إلى ذلك الوقت فأين سنهرب من هؤلاء وظيفتنا جميعا التعاون لخلق وظائف وليس وظائف حكومية وإنما وظائف في القطاع الخاص ليس كلها بوضع موظفين وإنما دور الانتربرنور زيك وزي إياد دور كبير إنه نخلق روح المخاطرة وعمل البزنس الصغير هو هذا ما سينجو باقتصادنا وسينجو بنا سياسيا واقتصاديا السلام عليكم قاسم الشيخ بجماعة بلادنا السعودية دكتورة ناهد أتمنى أن توضحي أكثر الليبر جروث ريت اللي بين 2.2 versus مقابل 0.5 في الكونستراكشن لأنه لا تزال عندنا مفهوم بأنه الكونستراكشن هو الحل الأمثل للليبر جروث والملاحظة اللي عندي ويمكن البنى اللي يقدروا يصححوني أو يخططوني أنه شراكة الدولة مطلوبة جدا جدا في كثير من القطاعات التي لا يرى القطاع الخاص فيها عائد ربح ليس مجزي وإنما معقول انترناشنالي ومثال على ذلك بعض المدن الاقتصادية التي تفتقر للبنية التحتية التي لا يستطيع القطاع الخاص أن يبني فيها الاكونومي اوف سكيل لليوتيليتيز قبل ما تأتي المصانع عشان تستعمل فنتمنى أن تكون شراكة الدولة هي البادئة في ذلك ثم بعد ذلك كما تجربة مرافق في الجبيل وينبع تبعد تلك الانتيتي الى القطاع الخاص بالضبط ولا نتكلم عن اللاند بريدج اللاند بريدج از ناجح واحنا مجموعه بلاد من اللي قدمنا عليه شكرا جزيلا شكرا آه بالنسبه للشراكه بين القطاع الخاص والعام آه هي اساسي للنجاح آه عدم وجود الانفراستراكشر عشان كده احنا اليوم بنقول انه عشان تقيم مصنع أو منجم لنفترض أنك تحتاج منجم تحتاج قطار وتحتاج ميناء بدون الثلاثة مع بعض ما تنجح فعشان كده أنه الحكومة لو اتجهت إلى الببليك برايفت بارتنرشيب أو الشراكة ستستطيع ميزانيتها أن تدخل كشريك فقط وبجزء هي تختاره في تمويل هذه المشاريع ولا تضع العب كاملا عليها ولكن يجب ان تكون ريجوليتد وبكيورمنت والاشياء اللي بيتكلموا عنها كلها تكون جاهزه لان يكون وين وين سيتويشن او وضع ناجح للجهتين شايف بدون ذلك لن يدخل القطاع الخاص في المشاريع الكبرى لانه القطاع الخاص قادم للربح ليس فقط الربح ومستعد ان يعمل الاثنين معا سوشيال ريسبونسبيلتي وربح ولكن لابد ان تكون الريجيوليشنز مساعده للقطاع الخاص بانه يدخل فلذلك انا ارى انه آه الكونستراكشن ما يخلق لوحده جوبز ويخلق والكونستراكشن لما بيخلق جوبز ايش بيخلق بنائين لو سكيل جوبز هذه ما تحتاج السعوديين كثير السعوديين عندهم شهادات انت بتبتعثهم بتجيبهم اوكي ممكن اللي هو مرة ما عنده سكيلز يدخل بس ايش حتكون ما يكفي الراتب انه يدخل في الـ في الـ انه يعيش يعني في المملكة ولكن الجروث اللي بيجي منه بسيط كقطاع انت انظر له كقطاع مش كابسلوت نمبر اوكي مش كرقم مطلق كقطاع الجروث فيه 
ضعيف مقابل ما يحدث في قطاع البتروكيميكال في قطاع الترانسبورتيشن لانه الترانسبورتيشن والبتروكيميكال بيخلق كلاسترز اوف سمول ميديم انتربرايزز شركات صغيره تقدر تدخل وتخدم فبالتالي الجروث بيشمل الجميع انما الكونستراكشن عماره وبناء وذات ست والبروفيت يروح في جيب المقاول ذات ست تفضل انا انا ودي اختلف معك شوي في الموضوع هذا اول شيء لما يكون عندك مثلا جامعه نوره وفي 60 الف واحد يشتغل فيها ليش ما عندنا 20 الف منهم يكونون سعوديين يشتغلون في في القطاع هذا ايش المشكله كبنائين لازم يكون عنده جريدر يروح يشتغل ويتسلف من صندوق التسليف وياخذ جريدر ولا قلابي ولا 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 ويقدر يشتغل فيه ويحصل راتب احسن من المضمون اللي موجود فيه احنا في احنا في المملكه وي جابد احنا نسينا من السبعينات من نهايه السبعينات الى اليوم شيء اسمه احنا بلد انتربرنورز كان اهلنا عندهم دكاكين محلات فلاحين يشتغلون في في سيارات في ترانسبورتيشن انتقلنا الى سوسايتي نبي نشتغل بشغل مضمون والرانكينج حق المضمون يبدا من الدوله وينتهي حول البنوك اللي هي المساهمه والشركات المساهمه وبعد ذلك ما ندور شغله يا جماعه لازم ترجع العمليه الطبيعة لا يمكن الاقتصاد انه يوظف الجميع في في الحكومه وفي في القطاع وفي الشركات الكبيره اذا ما جت طفره ال ألف بيت هذه في المملكه وفي الباحه سوى له شغله صغيره ودكان واشتغل وسوى له بزنس صغير وخذ له في سياره واشتغل فيها وخذ له جريدر واشتغل فيها ولا عنده ورشه موجوده فيها طالع كل المحلات اللي موجوده في المم... في 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 اي مكان موجود مين اللي يشتغل فيها هل هذه ما تسوي فلوس تسوي فلوس لذلك لا يمكن الا انك تعتمد انه القطاع الخاص القطاع الخاص كله حيوظف حيجي لكن الماجورتي في العالم كله هو سمول وميديم بزنس اكزاكتلي بس يا خالد واذا ما سو... واذا ما رجعنا لهذا الشيء هذا هالمشكلة حتكون تظل معنا إلى فترة طويلة جدا جدا لازم نرجع لوصولنا أن احنا كلنا نشتغل هالشغلات هذا ولا نقول أن السعودي غير قادر لأن السعودي زي ما بنوا ورامكو كلهم على ظهورهم وحفروا قادرين على يسوون اشياء اكثر من كذا بس انت يا خالد ما تختلف مع على كده معايا <تصفيق> انا ما بس ما انا بقول لك انا, أنا يعني احنا في طفره احنا في طفره كونستراكشن اذا الكونستراكشن هذا ما وظف سعوديين بي مهندسين فنيين اللي بالضبط. عندهم الامكانيات في انهم يسوون سب كونتراكت بزنس سبلاي تشين كل الاشياء هذه جزء منها بياخذوا واسطه ويجيبوا فيز بصراحه البيج كونستراكشن كومبانيز وبعدين غير كده انه ال... احنا وات ام توكينج اباوت انه نخلق وظائف في الميدل انكم لا الفقير ولا الغني يخلق اقتصاد اللي يعمل ريسايكلينج للماني هو الميدل انكم بيبل وي نيد ذات انجينيرز زي ما قال خالد انجينيرز تكنيشنز انتربرنورز يو هاف يو هاف دروب اوت من المدارس يو هاف ناس ما راح يكملون مدرسه لا؟ في اي مكان في العالم هذيل يجدون نف... وجدون وظائف يمكن بيدهم بس اعلى رواتب من الوظائف اللي في اللي في وظائف ممكن مضمونه في العمليه طيب. فيجب ان احنا يعني وي انكارج بيبل تو ورك الله الرحمن الرحيم امين الحلبي اهلا وسهلا فيك دكتوره ناهب بما انك استراتيجيه بما انك مديره رئيسه تنفيذيه في بنك ون جولف ون هل لديكم اليه لشراكة استراتيجية في قطاع التعليم لتقديمها للحكومة كونكم رئيس تنفيذي لبنك جولفون لما نلاحظه في الآونة الأخيرة أن التعليم الخاص انتقل إليه الطلاب السعوديين بسلاسة وأصبح الطالب هناك رافضا لتعلم اللغة العربية لست ضد تعلم اللغة الإنجليزية ولكن من تعلم لغة قوم أمن مكرهم كما قال الرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام ولكن لغتنا العربية هي لهويتنا فهل لديكم آلية لشراكة استراتيجية في قطاع التعليم لتقديمها للحكومة؟ آه نحن مستعدون آه وحدث نقاش مع وزارة التعليم اوريدي وان شاء الله آه سوف نقوم قريبا بعمل شراكة في عدة مجالات مع قطاع التعليم آه بالذات قطاع التعليم از ميوزك تو ماي هارت يعني قريب الى قلبي جدا واتمنى الشراكة فيه بكل المعطيات 
ونعدك ان شاء الله بكل خير خلال السنوات القليله القادمه جزاك الله الف خير على سؤالك شكرا لكم جميعا ثانك يو ايفريبادي ان ذا بانل اي ريلي ابريشيت يور سبورت تسلموا كلكم اودينس ننتقل الى الاستاذ تركي الدخيل شكرا للدكتوره ناه الطاهر تفضلي دكتور طيب بس قبل ما ننتقل للاستاذ تركي آه لو سمحت التصويت اي من مجالات الصناعه التاليه تعد مجالا مناسبا للشراكه بين القطاعين العام والخاص النقل البنيه التحتيه الاشغال العامه الرعايه الصحيه التعليم او اخرى اعيد التصويت الان التصويت جاهز Education and fiscal infrastructure. حقيقة الجميع. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الأخوة والأخوات حياكم الله مرة ثانية في جدول أعمال اليوم الثاني من منتدى جدة الاقتصادي جلستنا هذا اليوم تتناول موضوع الانتاجية الأساسية ومعي هنا متحدثين أود أن أرحب بهم فأبدأ بالدكتور بدر البدر وهو مدير تنفيذي لربط المجتمعات والمدن الذكية سايسكو سيستمز المملكة العربية السعودية الشرق الأوسط دكتور بدر يشغل منصب العضو المنتدب لقسم المجتمعات المتصلة في الأسواق الآسيوية والأفريقية الناشئة لهذه الشركة كما أرحب أيضا بعد ذلك بالدكتور بيتر ديامن ديس رئيس مجلس إدارة مؤسسة جائزة إكس أو إكس برايز التي تقود العالم في تصميم إطلاق جوائز تشجيعية وتحقيق اختراقات جذرية من أجل المنفعة الإنسانية وهو أيضا رئيس مجلس إدارة سينجلاريتي يونيفرسيتي والمؤسس المشارك ثم بعد ذلك أرحب بالسيد نيلسون ماتوس وهو نائب الرئيس لشؤون الهندسة وإدارة المنتجات لدى شركة جوجل في منطقة أوروبا والشرق الأوسط وأفريقيا وانضم للشركة عام 2007 وأصبح مسؤولا عن نشاط تطوير المنتجات والهندسة في أنحاء المنطقة قبل أن نبدأ وأترك المجال للمتحدثين لدينا استطلاع نود من حضراتكم المشاركة فيه عبر الأجهزة الموجودة أمامكم السؤال يقول في رأيك أي من التدابير التالية سوف يكون لها المساهمة الأكبر في زيادة الانتاجية في المملكة العربية السعودية الخيار الأول 
التعليم والتدريب الخيار الثاني الممارسات الإدارية الخيار الثالث اللوائح التنظيمية والسياسية سامحونا طايحة الياء من السياسية الخيار الرابع خيارات أخرى أرجو أن تبدأوا التصويت حصل على نسبة 59% التعليم والتدريب الممارسات الإدارية حصلت على 16% و19% للوائح التنظيمية والسياسية وأمور أخرى حصلت على 6% ننتقل أولا إلى الدكتور بدر البدر الذي أتمنى أن يتفضل بإلقاء ما لديه بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد أيها السيدات والسادة في البداية أود أن أخبركم أن الأخ تركي قمعني وطلب أن أغير لغة التحدث إلى اللغة العربية مما أتفق فيه معه وأشكره على ذلك ولكن أيضا أختصر وقت الحديث من إلى وقت أقل فبالتالي ستجوني أتحدث بسرعة قليلا فأرجو أن تستمحوني في ذلك حديثي اليوم سيكون عن كيف تتأثر الإنتاجية كيف تزداد الإنتاجية باستخدام تقنية المعلومات والاتصالات دعوني أبدأ بمعلومة كلكم تعرفونها أي أن العالم يتغير العالم يتغير اقتصاديا حيث أن أصبح الآن الدول النامية هي أكبر اقتصادات العالم مقارنة بالقرن الماضي حيث كانت الدول المتقدمة Developed Nations كانت هي المتصدرة في عام 2015 2050 ستكون ستة من أكبر عشر اقتصاديات هي من الاقتصادات النامية اقتصاد المملكة العربية السعودية يتوقع أن يكون في المركز الواحد والعشرين في 2015 عالميا سابقا بذلك هولندا والارجنتين العالم ايضا يتغير ليس فقط اقتصاديا ولكن سكانيا اقتصادات المتقدمه يزداد فيها الاعمار وتشيخ هذه المجتمعات ويقل اعدادها فيما ان الاقتصادات الناميه مثل المملكه العربيه السعوديه 50% من السكان أقل 25 سنة من العمر ويتوقع أن يزداد تعداد السكان بنسبة 66% في عام 2050 ليس فقط ذلك ولكن المجتمعات تتجه إلى المدن عالميا وفي السعودية حيث يتوقع أن يكون 90% من سكان المملكة في المدن الرئيسية بحلول عام 2050 والتغيير الأخير هو أن هناك تسارع في الارتباط بالإنترنت يتوقع أن يكون ثلاثة بليون شخص مرتبط في النقص عشر سنوات القادمة كل هذا يضع عبء كبير على الموارد البشرية عفوا على الموارد الطبيعية في الدول النامية وأيضا الطاقة العاملة في الدول, في الدول المتقدمة تقل وتقل إذن كيف ينمو الاقتصاد في ظل وضع, في ظل وضع كهذا؟ الجواب هو بزيادة الإنتاجية في رأينا الإنتاجية تتأثر بالاستثمار في تقنية المعلومات وهذا ليس رأينا فحسب ولكن في دراسة للأو إي سي دي منظمة التعاون والتكامل الاقتصادي وجدت أن هناك علاقة طردية بين الاستثمار في تقنية المعلومات والزيادة في الإنتاجية وكانت الدراسة هذه أجريت أو وجدت هذه العلاقة في الدول المتقدمة أما في الدول النامية فالعلاقة لم كانت متذبذبة والسبب في ذلك أن يجب أن يكون الاستثمار هو الاستثمار المناسب ليس أي استثمار مفيد حسب دراسات شركة سيسكو التي أمثلها فأن خلال العشر سنوات القادمة سيرتبط بالإنترنت أكثر من تريليون جهاز هذه الأجهزة تتراوح بين سيارات 
حساسات في مباني معدات طبية ليس فقط أجهزة الهاتف وأجهزة الحاسبات إذا ربطت بشكل صحيح وطور هذا النموذج من الممكن يؤدي ذلك لنمو كبير في الإنتاجية إلى خدمات جديدة تغير شكل الحياة وشكل العمل وبدون التفريط في المعادلة البيئية كيف نفعل ذلك؟ رؤيتنا هي ما نسميه المجتمعات الذكية المتصلة Smart Connected Communities هي تشغيل المجتمع القرية المدينة الدولة أو العالم على معلومات مشبكة بالتالي تكون هناك مباني ذكية مواصلات ذكية حكومة إلكترونية وخدمات خدمات صحية وتعليمية ذكية كل ذلك يؤدي إلى نمو اقتصادي واجتماعي وبيئي بعض النتائج المتوقعة لتطبيق هذه الأفكار في مدينة تستحدث مدينة جديدة مستحدثة تطبق هذه الأفكار منذ بدايتها في خلال عشرين سنة من عمرها أن يؤدي ومدينة حجمها حوالي خمسة مليون نسمة يؤدي مقارنة بمدينة أخرى لا تطبق هذه الأفكار أن هناك زيادة في الدخل الريفنيوز من بيع هذه الخدمات بمقدار 15 بليون دولار هناك نمو أكثر في الاقتصاد بمقدار 10% وتوفير في الموارد وخلق كبير للوظائف في هذه الحالة أكثر من 375 ألف وظيفة وحتى في المدن التي لا تطبق المدن التقليدية القائمة التي لا تنشأ بشكل لا تنشأ جديد هذه ممكن ممكن أن نصل إلى هذه الفوائد في خلال قرن أو عقد عفوا من الزمن من الممكن أن يكون هناك وفر كبير في استهلاك الكهرباء في استهلاك المياه في الازدحام المروري وفي معدل الجرائم وحتى الخدمات الصحية من الممكن أن تصل إلى أماكن أبعد وبتكلفة أقل باستخدام التقنية الشبكية مستقبل العمل أنه في رأينا أنه سيكون العمل مستقل عن موقعك أين تكون location independent تستطيع أن تعمل بغض النظر أين أنت فقط تحتاج إلى أن تتصل بالناس أو الزملاء في الوقت المناسب بالشكل المناسب يكون هذا هذا الاتصال بشكل سريع وكفء وأن يكون هناك تعاون بين العاملين داخل المنشأة ومع الموردين والعملاء والجهات الحكومية خارج المنشأة لو كانت جهة خاصة وهذا في رأينا هو مستقبل العمل تكون خدمة قريبة من خدمة الشبكات الاجتماعية سوشيال نتورك ولكن تكون انتربرايز سوشيال نتورك خدمات اجتماعية حكومية أو خاصة بمقر العمل كمثال على ذلك مثال على مستقبل العمل هناك تجربة قمنا بها بالتعاون مع شركات أخرى وجهات حكومية في أوروبا في ضاحية من ضواحي أمستردام في هولندا ما يسمى بمراكز العمل الذكية مراكز العمل هذه تنشأ بشراكة بين القطاع العام والخاص وتنشأ في مكان أقرب إلى المراكز السكانية ليست في أماكن العمل المزدحمة ولكن قريبة من التجمعات السكانية هو عبارة عن مركز يوفر خدمات اجتماعية مثل الرعاية رعاية الأطفال حضانة كافيتيريا خدمات تسوق بسيطة ويوفر بيئة عمل مريحة ومرنة 
بحيث أن العاملين من أكثر من شركة من الممكن يعملوا في مركز عمل واحد وبالتالي من الممكن دمج شريحة أكبر من العاملين في المجتمع وهذا حل من الحلول التي الممكن استخدامها لدمج المجتمع النسائي في مجتمع العمل بشكل أفضل من الممكن استخدام حل كهذا أيضا وتطبيقه مثلا في المدن البعيدة أو القرى البعيدة عن المدن السكانية عن المدن الكبرى لدمجهم في العمل دون حاجة إلى أنهم ينتقلوا إلى المدن الكبرى كيف نصل إلى رؤية كهذه إلى تغيير في أنماط العيش والعمل تحتاج إلى عدة أشياء تحتاج إلى رؤية سديدة تحتاج إلى تغيير في أنظمة العمل وليس فقط الأنظمة ولكن الحوافز العمل والتعليم يؤدي ذلك إلى قوة عاملة مدربة ويحتاج أيضا لا شك إلى استثمار في تقنية المعلومات ولكن الاستثمار الصحيح في تقنية المعلومات وقد يكون هذا من خلال شراكة بين القطاع والعام والخاص لا يجب ليس من المطلوب أن يكون كله يدفع من قبل القطاع العام نحن بحاجة إلى تغيير شامل في الذهنية في ذهنية العمل لنصل إلى هذه الرؤية هل من الممكن الوصول إلى إنتاجية أعلى بهذه الوسيلة لننظر إلى الماضي إلى التاريخ في المرحلة الأولى من حياة الإنترنت وصلنا إلى زيادة في الإنتاجية تقارب الخمسة في المية عندما كان التركيز فقط على الخدمات الأعمال في المرحلة الثانية من حياة الإنترنت وصلنا إلى إنتاجية أكثر أيضا عندما كان التركيز على المستهلك أو المستخدم أو الخدمات الاجتماعية ونتوقع أن نصل إلى نفس الزيادة في الإنتاجية في المرحلة الثالثة من حياة الإنترنت التي بدأنا نعيشها الآن وهي ما نسميه الإنترنت من الأشياء إنترنت of things عندما ترتبط أغلب الأشياء في حياتنا بالإنترنت هل من الممكن الوصول إلى هذه الرؤية؟ هل ممكن أن يكون للإنترنت هذا الأثر؟ لقد رأينا ذلك هل من الممكن أن تنتهي هذه المداخلة؟ ممكن أن تنتهي لو أعطيتني دقيقة واحدة أو أقل كما رأينا في أن الخريطة السياسية في العالم تغيرت باستخدام الشبكات الاجتماعية أنا واثق أن خريطة العمل والاقتصاد من الممكن أن تتغير بربط المجتمعات بشبكة معلوماتية شكرا دكتور بيتر أتمنى أن تتفضل بأداء كلمتك أو مداخلتك السلام عليكم It's a pleasure to be here So uh, I call this talk the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself and as the kingdom is looking to create a future of employment and productivity and education it is something to take actively into your hands and do rather than hope for uh, as such one of the things I'll be speaking about is that you get what you incentivize and if we can incentivize employment education and productivity in the proper fashion that's what will happen so the question is where do you want to drive a breakthrough uh, my own passion in the story which I'll speak to you about using incentive prizes was as my childhood wanting very much to fly into space that became my mission in life to help open the space frontier I dreamed about going into space uh, decided after a while that I was not going to do it through NASA and that I wanted to do this privately I had read about the fact that Charles Lindbergh as a young man crossed the Atlantic in 1927 to win a prize there was a $25,000 prize offered for the first person to fly between New York and Paris well incredibly this $25,000 prize which was considered crazy for someone to do attracted nine different teams who spent $400,000 to win this $25,000 prize 16 times the prize amount and what was extremely exciting when I'm reading this book was that in fact not only 
did the team spend 16 times the prize, but when Lindbergh actually made the flight, he changed the world's view about aviation. And between 1927 and 1929 in the United States, it went from 6,000 people buying airplane tickets to 180,000, a 30-fold increase. So I became excited about the idea of these incentive prizes to cause change in society, to create new businesses and new industries. And I started researching this idea of these prizes. And I learned that the very first prize was actually one created by the British government. It turned out in the 1700s, there were thousands of people losing their lives on the rocks because a, uh, someone at sea could tell uh, their latitude but not their longitude. And the British government offered up a king's, ran uh, a king's uh, ransom for the first person to be able to tell uh, the longitude accurately. And it was actually won by this man who was a clockmaker. All of the people in England thought it would be won by an astronomer who were the smartest people at the time. But this man ended up being, building a very accurate watch that allowed him to win the longitude prize. So for me, the idea was, how am I going to create a prize to open up the space frontier? So the idea came of creating something called the X Prize. It was going to be $10 million for the first team who could build a private spaceship to carry three adults up into space come back down, and then make the flight again within two weeks. When I announced this prize, people said it can't be done. It's a crazy idea. And in, the problem was, in the very beginning, I didn't have the $10 million. Uh, I went, announced this on the stage in St. Louis under the arch where Lindbergh received his capital. I was able to get the head of NASA and the head of the FAA to say this was a great idea. Ultimately, it was this couple, Hamid and Anush Ansari, who had been born in Tehran, came to the United States, became telecom entrepreneurs, loved this idea, put up the money. We called it the Ansari X Prize in their honor. Well, this $10 million prize for something that was considered crazy ended up attracting 26 teams from around the world who spent $100 million to try and win this $10 million prize. We had 26 different approaches for building private spaceships. And on the morning of October 4th in 2004, in the Mojave Desert of California, this vehicle, Spaceship One, took off. We had 30,000 people from around the world who came to watch this flight. And here is the vehicle taking off um, under power over the skies in California. And here you see it at 100 kilometers altitude in space. And when the vehicle landed, it was really about starting a new era in spaceflight. And on stage here with me is Paul Allen next to me, who funded the team, Bert Rutan, who built the vehicle, Brian Binney, who was the uh, astronaut who flew it, and then Richard Branson, who came in and bought the rights to commercialize the vehicle and ultimately create Virgin Galactic. We had 10 billion media impressions around the world we made the front page of Google. And the winning vehicle is now hanging in the Air and Space Museum. Again, something that was thought impossible by putting up a large incentive prize drove entrepreneurs around the world to solve that problem. And as you'll see, in the same way that I think these people can solve the issue about job creation and productivity. What I'd like to do is show you, show you a short video of that winning moment. If we could go to the video, please. We're announcing today something called the X Prize, a $10 million contest to privately build a spaceship that's able to carry three individuals, fly to 100 kilometers altitude, and do that twice inside of two weeks. I have never been myself as creative as I have eyeballing this goddamn prize. Sorry X Prize inspired international competition, drove regulatory reform, and made history. The X Prize 
It ignited a personal space flight revolution. So these prizes, if they're properly constructed, can get people to spend 10 to 50 times the prize money to try and solve your problem. They drive new industries and bring about non-traditional solutions. We've been able to build an amazing board of trustees from Larry Page and Eric Schmidt to James Cameron, the producer, and Ratan Tata to look at what are the world's biggest problems that we can use these incentive prizes to get the smartest people on the planet to focus on solving them. We do these prizes in life sciences, in exploration, in energy and environment, and education and global development. Uh, one of the first prizes we did was for a new generation of 100 mile per gallon equivalent cars. 136 vehicles around the world competed. The top 10 vehicles did up to 187 miles per gallon equivalent. That was co-sponsored by Cisco. With Google, we have a $30 million prize for the first team to build a robot and land it on the surface of the moon privately. In fact, this has been so important that NASA has matched that with $30 million of prize money. And ultimately, most recently, Wendy Schmidt, Eric Schmidt's uh, wife, has funded a $1.4 million X challenge to reinvent how we clean up spills on the ocean surface. 400 teams around the world have entered and we're down to the top 37, eventually the top three, and Shell is going to take the technology and put it into practice. So where are we going? We're looking at prizes in water, food, uh, in healthcare, in oceans, in going from a skin cell to regrowing a heart, a liver, a lung, in autonomous cars. But bringing it back here to the kingdom, the question is what are the opportunities for creating large incentive prizes to drive entrepreneurship and drive education to really address and solve some of these issues. So I share with you just two ideas. One I call an entrepreneurship X prize. Imagine a competition for teams, universities, organizations, NGOs, companies to find, train, and support a new generation of entrepreneurs to build companies in Saudi or the GCC or, or MENA. The winner would be the team whose entrepreneurs create the most jobs over the five-year period. Now, the ability of these prizes is you can say jobs that are in the high-tech industry count two for one. You can fine-tune this competition, but ultimately you will have teams around the world coming here to figure out how do we create these jobs, how do we train these entrepreneurs to really create the role models that will incentivize people to want to go and build companies here to employ your youth. Another idea we talk about is an education X prize. The youth are learning to learn in different ways, to use mobile platforms, to use gaming technology. So imagine, if you would, a new generation of educational games that teach math and science and skills in a mechanism that is effective, addictive, and viral. So the winner would be a team who builds an educational game that is 80% effective, meaning everybody who plays the game, 80% of them have learned the material. It's addictive, 80% who start the game will end the game. And it's viral as it grows to whatever target you hit, 100,000 or a million users. So ultimately, you get what you incentivize. And the question is, what is the vision of the future you wish to create? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter. Shukran jazeelan li Dr. Peter. Al-an al-kalima li Sayyid Nelson Matus, naib al-rais li al-handasa fi Google. Wa kama qamaat al-Dr. Badr wa talabtu minhu an yatahadath bil-arabiyya. Aw shirktu an aqma'ahu wa atlab minha an yatahadath bil-arabiyya li an yiraytu lahu al-yawm fi jiridat al-hayat. Sura wa hulabis shmag. Fa kunt mustamta' bi suratu. I like what you wear today in al-hayat newspaper. Thank you. Uh, and good morning. And I, I apologize for two things. First, for not being able to speak Arabic. And second, for not using my uh, Saudi outfit today. Uh, we had a, an event in uh, Riyadh the last uh, two days, uh, which was fantastic. I will, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of my points. And uh, I had the, the pleasure, together with uh, many of our Googlers, to use the typical Saudi outfit, which I learned it's quite comfortable, I must say. Um, 
I come from the boring company, and as such, I'm just going to sit here and talk. I don't have beautiful slides to, uh, to show it to you. And uh, what I would like to do in the next uh, seven minutes or so is, is address three points, uh, which are really the key messages I would like to deliver. Uh, the first one is really highlighting how entrepreneurship and innovation are key to increase productivity in actually any country. Um, Google, as you probably know, is uh, it's known worldwide as a search engine. Um, however, uh, what a lot of people don't recognize or don't realize is that we are also an engine for economic growth uh, for, for thousands of small businesses around the globe. Uh, technology and the internet specifically has brought new business models, e-commerce, uh, new, uh, new ways to be creative and, and innovate. And uh, both from a business perspective as well as from the consumer, bringing information to pretty much anyone, anywhere uh, actually in, in the world. Um, I would claim that the internet is probably the largest innovation platform in history of, of humankind. And we obviously need to take advantage of that. Uh, it helps immediately entrepreneurs anywhere in the world to reach millions and millions of people with a single website, uh, creating new business opportunities across the board. Uh, it obviously also enables open and free exchange of information, which is absolutely critical for growth in any uh, nation. Uh, I want to share some data that was just a few days ago published by a study of Boston Consulting that has looked at what, what is the impact of internet in the growth of different countries. And that report showed that today, 3.6% of the Czech Republic GDP uh, is dependent, is coming from actually activity on the internet. And this is likely to grow to 5.7% by 2015. Well, you may say, well, that's the Czech Republic. It's a very small country, still in its process of development. That same report actually covers France. And it showed that in 2009, uh, the internet was responsible for 3.2% of France's GDP, which is, a, which is approximately 60 billion euros. And it's more than the whole sector of energy, transport, and agriculture in that country. The internet in France alone has created 700,000 jobs since it started about 15 years ago, and it's likely to continue to grow. The expectation is that by 2015, the internet is going to be responsible for 5.5% of France's GDP, and is going to be creating in the next four years 450,000 new jobs in France alone. Obviously, the success of the internet requires entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship requires a very fertile environment for innovation. And Saudi Arabia, like all the countries, should therefore build an innovation ecosystem that supports job creation and, and obviously with that, the economic growth. Uh, from businesses taking risks online, governments creating fa uh, favorable internet regulatory environments, as well as economic and fiscal incentives, uh, it is all necessary to enable that process. And this is, cannot be done alone. This cannot be done by a single company. Uh, it's going to require the collective environment for many of you that are sitting in this room here today. So um, what is also important to remember is that it's not only going to be education, investments, fiscal and regulatory, changes that are going to be necessary. It is also very important to recognize that it's necessary to change the cultural shift that will encourage risk-taking and obviously tolerates failures, because failures is a consequence of people taking more risks. So the second point I would like uh, to, uh, or the second point I would like to cover is really about cloud computing and how open access and internet technology are strong enables of increased productivity. Um, as you know, um, Google was born and has ever been since its early days uh, a highly innovative environment. Um, it has created many successful products that I know uh, you are familiar with, but what you may not know is that those products, and in particular the speed with which we bring these products to market, is a consequence of a platform that we have created 
that has enabled significantly our internal productivity, as well as increase our internal collaboration and communication. And by doing that, speeding or, 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 or speed, or, uh, increasing the speed with which we actually both innovate as well as bring new products to markets. A few years back, we actually opened these services to the whole internet, uh, to any users, any businesses across the globe, so that people can take advantage of what we call cloud computing, which is nothing more than the platform that we use internally for developing our products, so that even small businesses anywhere of the world can, a can access this best of breed technology and bring solutions to the market very, very quickly. So products like App Engine and Google Gmail and Calendar and Sites, etc., are part of that uh, collection of uh, products. I therefore believe that government should embrace cl the cloud computing paradigm has proven to be a significant boost in productivity. And they should actually do that by creating the, the necessary regulatory environment, but also the economic and fiscal incentives. But most importantly, I think governments should lead by example and embrace and deploy that technology within their institutions and agencies, and by doing that, encourage the private sector to do the same. I'm going to finish um, my, my, uh, my little spiel here with my third point, uh, sharing with you a little bit of the internal environment that Google has to foster innovation. This is not the official view of Google. This is basically my personal experience after having joined Google um, after 20 years in the industry and have worked in different environments and trying to observe what was different at Google internally that had created such a great environment for innovation. And with that, I came up with six rules. And I think they are very actually interesting to all of you. And I think there is ways for Saudi Arabia to actually apply those rules within the context of a government. The first rule, is Google trends to hire and do everything possible to hire the absolutely best people. Obviously, that tells you it's extremely important for, for this country to continue to provide education, invest in research, development, training, etc. Second rule, foster entrepreneurship. Inside of Google, this means giving all of our employees time and resources for them to pursue their own ideas. You probably have heard the 20% time one day of a week that each Google employee can actually use to pursue their own ideas. But together with that comes the encouragement for risk taking, and we are very bullish of encouraging our employees to do that, and also accepting that failures are just natural, a natural consequence of taking more risks. The third rule is ensure transparency which basically means that every single person has absolutely the same chance. This is particularly important because you never know who's going to be the one that has that brilliant idea. And, can I, and I can assure you that it's very likely not to be the person on the top. It's very likely to be somebody on the, on the bottom. So give everyone the same chance so that whoever has that brilliant idea, that idea will flourish. Um, related to the previous one is make all your decisions data-driven. Don't rely on titles or positions for decisions to be made. Look at the facts. Look at the data and base all your decisions purely on the data that is collected and actually will help you make much better decisions. Five, don't think short term but long term. If you think short term, you are likely to put compromises. You are likely to cu cut corners. In Google, we basically say, put the users first. Acquire lots and lots of users, lots and lots of traffic. Then we'll figure out how we'll make money. And last, which tends to be neglected, but it's extremely important, is speed does matter. Move very fast. Increase a sense of urgency. Uh, you never know if the idea that you just had is not going to be coming up in somebody else's brains, and that person may move faster than you and bring it to market before anybody else. So um, I have been to Saudi Arabia before, and, and I just said I, meant, I mentioned that I have been uh, in Riyadh organizing this uh, event. And when I look at this country, I do believe that uh, most of the ingredients and these six rules do exist here uh, already. Um, we just had our first ever Google Developer Days uh, in Riyadh in the last two days. 
and we had over 1,700 participants. On the first day, which was dedicated more to the technical community developers, over 1,000 people showed up when we had actually organized the event for about six to 700. And I was particularly impressed with the significant participation of my female colleagues. More than half of the participants were female. And here is what I saw. First of all, surprisingly excellent skills and level of knowledge. Really, I was very impressed with that. Significant hunger to learn. You had to see how attentive people were in the training sessions. High level of engagement, interest, and commitment. And also strong entrepreneurship spirit, particularly, again, from the female participants. But above all, a very strong desire to create, do something, create a new website, a new web service, uh, a new mobile application, uh, and so on and so, so forth. Uh, I was so impressed with the engagement and the high level of commitment that I saw. Mr. Nelson, more than 10 minutes now. 20 seconds. Okay. That, I, that I basically announced that Google are bringing the ambassador program to this country and that I'm actually extending the number of opportunities for internships for computer scientists at our 10 uh, different research centers in uh, Europe, in, in, uh, in the Middle East, and we are going to be reserving some of those specifically for the female computer scientists. Um, I do think they are brilliant, and I could see that by those that attended the, uh, the conference. Uh, and I just think that they really need the, just the right working environment and the right investment and support. Thank you. Shukran jazeelan Mr. Nelson Matus, Naib Rais fi Google Al Handasa. عندما كنت أطلب من السيد نيلسون أن يقتصر على سبع دقائق وقد كان المنظمون طلبوا منها أن يلقي عشر دقائق. أيضا طلبت من الدكتور نفس الطلب وكلهم ألقوا فوق العشر دقائق فيعني صار في عدل فقلت له إذا ما نقدر نحصل كلمتك والجوجلت تعرفون مصطلح القوقلة أن تضع الكلمة في خانة البحث وتبحث عنها كانت أوبرا تقول شكرا لله هناك جوجل آه لدينا الآن استفتاء أو استبيان نود أن تتفضلوا بالمشاركة عليه عبر أجهزة التصويت التي أمامكم هل تعتقد تعتقدين أن الثروة النفطية تؤثر سلبا على إنتاجية السعوديين الخيار الأول أوافق بشدة أن الثروة النفطية تؤثر سلبا على إنتاجيتنا نحن السعوديين الخيار الثاني أوافق بدون شدة الخيار الثالث محايد يعني ما أدري الرابع لا أوافق لم تؤثر الثروة النفطية علينا وعلى إنتاجيتنا الخامس لا أوافق بشدة لم تؤثر أبدا 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 تفضلوا صوته إذا أثرت بنسبة 33% يرون أن الثروة النفطية أثرت بشكل كبير على إنتاجية السعوديين و28% يرون أنهم يوافقون يعني تقريبا أكثر من 50 60 61% يرون أنها أثرت تسعة بالمية ما يدري ثمنتاشر بالمية لا يرى أن الثروة أثرت أبدا واثنى عشر بالمية وهو ما يشكل ثلاثين بالمية لا يرون أن الثروة النفطية أثرت على إنتاجية السعوديين شكرا لكم إبراهيم عباس نتو سيداتي سادتي يعني كإنذار مبكر تعليقي سيكون مختلف عن المألوف فسامحوني من بدري سمعنا من الدكتور بدر البدر وغيره طبعا وسنسمع بعده عن مشكل المشكلة السكانية وأن البلد متروسة شباب وبشرنا الدكتور بدر أنها حتزيد ترسا في المستقبل حاليا 25 سنة وأكثر أقل من 25 نسبتهم 50% بشرنا الدكتور بدر انه في 2050 سيكونوا 66% اقتراحي آه تعليقي المخالف للمالوف معليش واكرر استسماحي انه فيما لما نتكلم عن الانتاجيه وطبعا نسعى دائما انتاجيه المعلومات انتاجيه التدريب انتاجيه الاداء انتاجيه الوقت الى اخره 
اللي بودي أعلق عليه هو إنتاجية من نوع آخر وأرجو أن نخفضها أن نخفضها وهي الإنتاجية البشرية التكاثر السكاني سيداتي سادتي اسمعوني مرة ثانية التكاثر السكاني حيخرب بيتنا في هذه البلد وفي المنطقة كلها تسمعوا مثلا في الدول العربية 23 ولا بعض الأحيان 21 زائد ناقص 2 دكتور نتو ممكن ركز على إنتاجية الاختصار هي دي هي دي الإنتاجية البشرية أنا بدي أن نخفضها لأنه تسمع أنه في البلدان النامية والنايمة أنه النسبة حقة البطالة مرتفعة خذ مثال بسيط آخر واحدة منه حقة ليبيا ليبيا بلد تقريبا كبرها كبر بلدنا سكانها ربع بلدنا واحد وعشرين في المية بطالة طبعا لما الناس تكاثروا مزواجيات وزواجات بالأربعة وبالخمسة زائد ناقص رايحين جايين ثم يوصل عندهم الواحد لستة عشر طفل طبعا هذا فصل دراسي كامل كيف حتدربهم كيف حتوظفهم كيف حتعالجهم شكرا وكيف دكتور. حتوظفهم يا تركي مع الكلمه الاخيره تركي كيف واضح حتوظفهم واضح المداخله عندنا ناس ثانيين انا اعدك ان شاء الله ان نوقف تفريخ شكرا 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 السلام عليكم ورحمه الله عليكم السلام دكتوره نوره خالد السعد اكاديميه وكاتبه اول اشكر المحاضرين كنت ساعلق تعليق اخر لكن استفزني تعليق الدكتور نتو بأنه لابد أن نوقف الإنتاجية البشرية أنا أقول المملكة قارة والثروة النفطية تغطي إلى 40 مليون وليس فقط 15 مليون الخطأ ليس في تقليص الإنتاجية البشرية إنما في عدالة توزيع الثروة وفي إعادة النظر في كيف نحدث هذه الإنتاجية شكرا السلام عليكم الحقيقة سؤالي ما هو في تقليص الثروة البشرية أو زيادة الثروة البشرية سؤالي هو في كيفية استثمار الثروة البشرية الحالية تعرفنا بحضرتك لو سمحت معكم المهندس محمد الزايدي الفائز في المنافسة الوطنية الأفضل خطط عمل لمشاريع الشباب شكرا سؤالي للدكتور بيتر الحقيقة دكتور بيتر احنا تجربة المنافسات والمسابقات موجودة عندنا في المملكة لله الحمد وقد أثرت تنافسية بين الشباب ورواد الأعمال لكن سؤالي هو في نقل تجربتكم في كيفية الاستفادة من الفائزين أو ماذا بعد للفائزين للرابحين الفائز هو عنده مشروع عنده رؤية فماذا بعد ذلك للفائز أو اللي يحقق الفوز إيش إيش بعد ذلك إيش إيش حيكون له يعني شكرا يا بشوان السلام عليكم دكتورة سوزانا قرشي كينج عبد العزيز يونيفرسيتي ماي كويستشن تو مستر نيلسون وات ليسنز سعودي يوث كان ليرن فروم جوجل انتربرينيور شيب اكسبيرينس شكرا يا دكتورة انا اشجع الاسئلة المختصرة رقم خمسة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته المهندس طلال سمرقندي رئيس لجنة المكاتب الهندسية بالغرفة التجارية بجدة ومدير عام مكتب الخطوط المعمارية الحقيقة ملاحظة سريعة وتوصية الملاحظة أن الأخ بيتر أضاف كلمة مهمة جدا حقيقة في تنظيم الجوائز أن يتم تصميم هذه الجوائز بطريقة صحيحة حتى يتم الاستفادة منها يمكن الكلمة كانت عابرة لكنها مهمة جدا لأنه في عندنا أمثلة كثيرة في تصميم مسابقات وجوائز لم تعطي ثمارها بالعكس يعني أضعت وقتنا ووقت المساهمين وأقربها المسابقة طبعا الهيئة العليا للتطوير ومدينة الرياض للتصميم المسكن السعودي شارك فيها أكثر من 7000 شخص من جميع أنحاء العالم وفي النهاية فاز فيها واحد اسكندنافي وضع لنا حلول لا يمكن أن تنطبق للشعب السعودي إطلاقا. والمثال للأمثلة الجيدة مسابقة الأخان للعمارة الإسلامية واللي استمرت الآن أكثر من 20 سنة. التوصية لو سمحت تفضل الحقيقة الأنظمة السعودية تغفل اغفالا كبيرا في الحلول التقنيه، واتمنى ان يطلع توصيه من المنتدى بضروره قبول الحلول التقنيه كجزء من الانظمه الموجوده في المملكه، وعلى سبيل المثال يعني عندنا في الهيئه السعوديه المهندسين يجب ان يكون جميع المهندسين مداومين بجسدهم فيزيائيا في مكتبك ولا لا شكرا لك يا شكرا لك يا باشمهندس. مها عبد الله الدباغ استاذ مساعد جامعه الملك عبد العزيز. آه سؤالي للدكتور بدر البدر. 
المشروع جميل وواعد ولكن هل هناك تأثير سلبي من فقدان الهوية الأصلية كالتراث والعادات والتقاليد وعلى رأسها الدين وكيفية الحفاظ عليها شكرا لك أستاذة طيب السادة المتحدثين سأترك لكل واحد خمس دقائق ليجيب على الأسئلة التي وجهت له من حيث الإجمال أبدأ بالدكتور بدر وأود أن أسأل سؤال إضافي على ما تفضلت به من أن الثورة التقنية كيف تساهم في إنعاش الجانب الاقتصادي من 1 يناير 2011 بلشت الثورات العربية البوك فيس على رواية القذافي وتويتر وغيرها شدوهم من أذانهم وحانت ساعة من يعرف مين هل يمكن أن تؤثر الثورات العربية التي نشأت من طريق الانترنت على الانترنت لجهة تحجيم الحكومات لحرياتها لو داري انكم تصفقون كان سالتم من اول ما بدينا. <تصفيق> دعوني اعلق اولا على التاثير السلبي للانظمه الجديده للعمل والمعيشه. لا ارى ارتباط سلبي لهذه الانظمه الجديده مع عاداتنا ونحن نستطيع ان نطوعها بالطريقة التي تناسب مجتمعاتنا في الواقع أنا أرى أنها مفيدة أكثر العمل من المنزل العمل عن بعد العمل في مراكز ذكية تساعد النساء مثلا على العمل في بيئة أريح قد تكون مريحة لفئة منهم فلا أرى أي تعارض والتجارب السابقة لم تثبت لي على الأقل أن هناك تعارض هذا بالنسبة له بالنسبة للحكومات والإنترنت هناك تقارير تتحدث على أن الإنترنت تتعرض إلى تحجيم في كثير من الدول ولكن التقنية الآن وصلت إلى مرحلة متغلغلة ومتنوعة بالتالي صعب جدا السيطرة عليها فلا أعتقد أنه من الممكن لا في الحال أو في المستقبل القريب أن يستطيع أن يكون هناك في مقدرة تقنية على السيطرة على الإنترنت طيب بس السبيتش اللي قدمه السيد نيلسون تحدث عن نسب لمبيعات من خلال الإنترنت في دول مختلفة والسيد بيتر تحدث عن تعزيز فرص الإنتاجية من في السعودية عندنا مشكلة بالسعودية وهي أن البيع بالإنترنت حتى الآن لم يتم تشريعه هل هناك وفقا لمعرفتك نية لفتح هذا الباب؟ لا أعرف يمكن ما يعرفون المستر الدكتور بيتر والمستر نيلسون أنه لا يمكن البيع بالإنترنت عبر الكريدت كارد بالسعودية حتى الآن هو ليس مقننا المن... ليس ممنوعا وهناك بعض البنوك المحلية التي تقدم هذه الخدمة وأنا أعرف على الأقل بنك واحد يقدم هذه الخدمة يقدم بطاقة كريدت كارد بليمت منخفض بسعر الأهم في مجال البيع عن طريق الإنترنت هو جانب البائع أن البائع يستطيع أن يحصل على القيمة من خلال الإنترنت وهذه أهم من ممكن استخدام أي بطاقة ائتمانية من قبل المشتري هي المشكلة من قبل البائع وهناك على الأقل بنك واحد يقدم الخدمة للبائعين أي بنك؟ بنك سامبا هو الوحيد اللي يقدم هو هذا اللي اعرفه، قد يكون هناك بنوك اخرى لكن اعرف بالتحديد، وهناك خدمة عالمية مشهورة أعلنت مؤخرا أنها ستق... ستسمح في البيع من خلال في السعودية وكانت مغلقة سابقا وهي خدمة باي بال. الميزة في هذه الخدمة أنه كثير من الخدمات الاجتماعية معتمدة عليها، فهذا مجال آخر للبيع من خلال الإنترنت. مجال ثالث وهو خدمة أبل أبل ستور والأب ستور تبع أبل، أيضا من الممكن البيع من خلاله في المملكة العربية السعودية، فمن الممكن القول أن هناك حلحلة إذا استط... إذا كانت هذا المصطلح صحيح أو فصيح، أن الأمور في طور التحسن ولله الحمد. جميل. دكتور بيتر كان في أكثر من سؤال تم توجيهها لك وأبرزها سؤال المهندس الزايدي عندما يتم هناك منافسة بعد المنافسة ماذا يفعل الفائز؟ So uh, thank you uh, again an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, I will address that I'd like to say one comment about the population and the youth which is I respectfully say to you that you should be looking at your youth as obviously your greatest resource. And the fact that you have a high population of youth is an amazing thing. If you look across the world at the average age of Nobel laureates, the average age of people who win the Nobel Prize, they do their work in their late 20s. 
If you look back in 1961 when President JFK said we'd go to the moon, the average age of the engineers and scientists who built the Apollo program from nothing was 27 years old. If you look back at the start of the dot-com revolution in the early 90s, the average age of the scientists and entrepreneurs and engineers who created all of the main companies, again, were in their early 20s. Youth is a resource to build a global economy here in Saudi, and it is a vision that you can take on and see them as the strongest resource you have. So I, I leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, the questions, uh, two questions I heard on prizes, uh, the first about what happens after the prize is done, and the, the question about the design of prizes, those two are linked. When we create these prizes, these prizes are not for recognizing someone for something they did in the past. The prize is to incentivize and encourage people to do something that everybody else thinks is impossible but to do it in the future. And it says, I don't care where you went to school, what you've done, if you make this happen, you win. And so the design of the prize is everything. It's the DNA of the competition. And when we create these prizes, we design them so when the prize is won, it starts a new industry. It creates a new capability. It, the, it changes the mind of people of what is possible. So in creating an entrepreneurship prize, it is saying we can create a new generation of entrepreneurs here in the kingdom who are able to create jobs. If it's creating a new education prize, we can create a new set of educational tools that is matched to the youth that makes it fun to learn about science, engineering, technology, and makes them want to learn and become competitive in the global markets in these areas. Uh, Dr. Peter, I want to ask you a question, and uh, it's a question for both of you. Uh, you and Mr. Nelson. Uh, I'll ask it in Arabic uh, if you don't mind. نحن في دولة نفطية ريعية يمكن تصنيفها على أنها دورة أبوية. لا أرجو أن لا يفهم سؤالي على أنه تبرئ لأدوار الحكومة. لكن إذا لم تقم الحكومة بتقديم العون للمبتكرين للمتع لمن يحاول أن يقدم تنافس خصوصا من الشباب هل هذا يعني أن نقف مكتوف في الأيدي؟ أم إذا لم تتحدث الحكومة أو لم تقدم مبادرات الحكومة فهذه مشكلة دكتور بيتر بليز أنسر إذا نقول إلى مستر نيلسون So uh, I'd like to echo uh, the words that my colleague from Google said which is to have true entrepreneurship and true breakthroughs it requires taking risk it requires willingness to fail because every major, the day before something is truly a breakthrough, the day before it's a great idea, usually it's a crazy idea. And so where in society do you allow people to try out crazy ideas, allow them to take risks and take failure? If you don't allow for risk and failure, you cannot have breakthroughs. The two go hand in hand. And so it's about, it's about changing culture, which is the most difficult thing. Uh, especially uh, in a culture as proud and as long as, as the kingdom has. So it, it is, um, if it is clear that the future needs to change, if, it is, if a, a vision of the future can be created, then the question is how do you incentivize people uh, to make that happen? Um, and uh, I was, I was, I was uh, uh, impressed by the question asked earlier. Um, the, the riches of this nation uh, can be used to help accelerate and create a future faster than any other nation if that's used as the incentive and, and the risk can be taken here. So, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nelson, uh, the same question and the other questions. Please. So, so are, you, are you referring to the last question? Yes, please. Okay. Um, actually, I have to agree with, uh, with my, uh, my colleague. Um, in particular, I think the biggest role for the government to play is on the cultural shift. This is, one, this is something that is very, very difficult to do. Um, it's something that cannot happen overnight. And only the government can enable an environment where people will feel more comfortable taking risks and failing uh, all along. Uh, obviously, there's other things the government can do in terms of regulatory and investments, etc. But 
those are also things, particularly on the investment front, things that the private sector can take care of and can also help. But the change in culture in a country has to come uh, from, uh, from the government mainly. Um, can I add two points to the previous comments? Um, on, on, the, uh, on the comment about e-commerce e or e-sales, um, I don't think that, that um, Saudi Arabia should be looking at the models that exist in the West necessarily. When I look at, for example, e-commerce in Russia, Russia has exactly the same uh, problem you have here. Not a lot of uh, credit cards and uh, the banking system is not uh, heavily used. However, e-commerce is extremely popular in Russia and they have basically developed a different business model. You buy online and you pay when you receive the goods. Um, also, if you look in some parts of Africa, the e-commerce is being developed purely based on mobile payments. Also, because banking system doesn't, does not exist uh, in the country. So, I think it's important for this country to look at the benefits of the internet and adapt them to what is possible uh, within, within your environment. Um, I also want to echo the, uh, the, the, the point about youth being a huge, huge resource. Um, it's no secret that the, uh, the average engineer that works at Google is extremely young and those are the guys responsible for all the cool products that we have delivered. However, it's also important to remember you only see the successes, right? Those that we actually brought outside, but you have not seen the thousands and thousands of attempts of other ideas that didn't go anywhere. But it's exactly that internal environment that allow many of these ideas to flourish and, and then one of them will actually survive and, and then will launch and become a big success. It's what caused so many ideas to flourish. Thank you so much. Ladina Sual Stifta Akhir or survey. Yabhar Mufrud al Anna Mamakum. A sual yakul halta atakid an al amal al rachisa. تؤثر سلبا على إنتاجية السعوديين والخيار الأول أوافق بشدة على أن العمالة الرخيصة تؤثر سلبا على إنتاجية السعوديين الخيار الثاني أوافق بس بدون شدة الخيار الثالث لا أدري أو محايد الخيار الرابع لا أوافق الخامس لا أوافق بشدة تفضلوا بالتصويت نتيجة التصويت 52% يوافقون بشدة على أن العمالة الرخيصة تؤثر على إنتاجية السعوديين 22% يوافقون فقط 4% محايدين 15% لا يوافقون على أن العمالة الرخيصة تؤثر على إنتاجية السعوديين و8% يوافقون لا يوافقون بشدة ليس لدي الكثير من الوقت الحقيقة مشكلة ترى اللي يرفع أصبعه ما يشوف إنه وراء ستمية واحد رافعين أصابعهم ففيه ما عندي وقت للأسف أبعتذر منكم لكن أود أن أختم بعد أن أشكر الدكتور بدر والدكتور بيتر ومستر نيلسون على هذه الجلسة الثرية أختم بكلمة لجوش مارين يقول التحديات هي ما تجعل الحياة شيقة التغلب على هذه التحديات هو ما يجعل للحياة معنا جعل الله لحياتنا جميعا معنا شكرا لحضوركم والسلام عليكم أود مشكورين أن أذكركم بأن الجلسة الثالثة ستكون في الثانية بحول الله وعنوانها ما بعد الكوارث فإلى تلك الجلسة والله يحفظكم